I call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for July 10, 2018. Earlier this evening, the board convened a closed session in accordance with the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss, one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of our closed meeting may be found on our website at www.bcps.org. <laughs> slash board slash minutes slash. I now invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Uh, uh, to be led by the scouts from Troop 475, that's in Parkville, Sixth and we'll, district. that's the 6th District. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in the county. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. The first item on our agenda is to consider the agenda. Mrs. White, are there any changes to tonight's agenda? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, there are two recommended changes to this evening's agenda. The first is to add item P2, resolution, resolution on school climate, student behavior, and discipline, and uh, to move item R6, employee benefits reserve fund, to item P3 as a discussion item. In accordance with the Board of Education Policy 8314, a unanimous consent of uh, board members is uh, required. All in favor of those? Yeah, I, have a, I have an agenda item as well. Well, let's vote on those two, please. All in favor of those two changes, signify by saying aye and raising your hands. Aye. 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 Did you say aye? No, I'm not saying aye. I'd like to hear Ms. Miller's uh, agenda item. Okay, so we have two items we can vote. We can have a third one after that. Um, but we need unanimous consent on those two. Are we? Um, so we're not, there's no unanimity, those matters won't be on the agenda. I would like to. Well, we're gonna do it in order, Mrs. Causey. We're gonna vote on these two and then we're gonna vote on another. Mr. Chair, I don't believe there's any reason why we can't amend your motion at this time to add exactly. a third item. I can understand why you right. would like to manipulate that. I'm not trying to manipulate way, anything. Okay, then we'll have your motion as a motion to amend the motion to amend, I mean the motion to amend the agenda. Is there a second to that? Uh, we didn't hear the whole uh, motion to amend. I'm not making a motion to amend. Oh, I'm making a motion to amend the item of uh, that was of great interest to our stakeholders related to the CEP program. And I understand that uh, Mr. Virch has suggested to PRC that it be on the PRC uh, good and welfare item, uh, but that meeting will not take place until September, I believe. So you so move to like amend the agenda to add a CEP item. Is there a second to that? Second. All right, this is a motion to amend the motion already. So all those in favor of the motion to amend the motion, please raise your hands. One, two, three, the motion fails. Now the motion is Mrs. White's m recommended suggestion to change and add items P2 and P, P1 and P2. I'm sorry, P2 and P3. All in favor of that motion? You have con discussion? Uh, yes, I'm Ms. actually Dawson. gonna amend this motion. I'm making a motion to amend this motion to add as an agenda item to the next Board of Education meeting. Mike. It's on. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm making a motion to amend this motion to add the CEP item about nutrition for our children in our schools with high poverty to the next Board of Education meeting. There were a number of questions and comments that came in from stakeholders and board members, and I would like that to be part of I, the I agenda believe, item. I believe that's out of order because the, the issue before us is the agenda for tonight, not for next meeting, is that correct? Yes. All right, it's out of order. I don't agree that it's out of order, okay. but. It's, 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 all right, any other, now, any other, before, are we ready to vote on P2 and P3? All in favor, please raise your hands. It appears to be unanimous. Very good. So we'll proceed with the agenda as amended. 
Mr. Chair, I had another item. Another agenda amendment item? Yes. Okay. Um, to add a uh, second reader on the policies that are being uh, commented on tonight. There is no second reader on those, so they won't be moved forward to third reader. Okay, is there a second to that motion? Second. All right, discussion. Um, typically, we have first, second, and third reader where the board has an opportunity uh, the policies and then vote on moving them forward. But we're having uh, public comment on four policies with no second reader vote by the board. All right, it seems to me, Mrs. Miller, that the standard practice of this board is to introduce um, a policy, have public comment on the policy, and then have a third reader vote on the policy discussion and vote. Is there a, is there a second to Mrs. Miller's? Uh, there was a second, I'm sorry. And I'd um, like to reply to your comment. It, it, our standard practice is to have first reader, second reader, and third reader. We had first reader. There is no second reader, but we're doing public comment on it as though it's second reader, but it's not. It has not been introduced as second reader. Further discussion? Mrs. Causey. I would just like Mr. Verge to comment on the process that we're using and if there's a concern that Ms. Miller has that he could address that in terms of when the second reader process would be available. Well, we have a parliamentarian and that's um, our board attorney and that's who should rightfully comment. I don't think this is a Robert's Rules issue. It's more of a, a policy issue. Mr. Nussbaum, anything to add? Okay. No, it's the public comment for those policies. The it's, second reader. Well, it should be, but there is no agenda item second reader, so therefore the, the board is not just debating or voting. Okay. So it's not second reader. Okay. Further no, further well, discussion. You have to have second reader. Well oh, that's by just the board. our that's just our policy. Further discussion on the motion to amend the agenda. Policy. If you read our policy, Mr. Parliamentarian. It talks about um, public comment being during second reader. We have no second reader, but we're having the public comment. This isn't our normal practice. My, my assumption is that these four policies that are listed here under E3 is actually second reader as those four policies. Well, that's an incorrect okay. uh, assumption because okay. there is further, no agenda item second reader. Further discussion. All in favor of. All in favor of Mrs. Miller's motion to amend to add second reader on policies, please raise your hand. One, two, three, the motion fails. So now, Mrs. Causey. Mr. Chair, I think it's an issue of, uh, well, not semantics, but proper labeling of the, okay. of the process, which you Very can good. just amend through okay. amending Suppose, the agenda. Uh, I, I told you that we have that as our standard operating procedure. Now, first item on our agenda is item D, selection of speakers. Now. Is that right? Is that where we are? Are we, are we good with that? Okay. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting. For anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting, board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign up cards for this evening have been placed in a box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. Now, our newest member of the board, our student board member, Halima, is going to draw the first names. All right, our first one is Dr. Bash Faron. Number two is Justin Bardo. Our third one is Terry Anderson. Fourth is Josh Landers. Fifth is Jay Jimenez. Sixth is David Riley. Seven, 
David Raider the second. Eight. Tam Lynn Kelly. Nine. Don Raider. And ten is Deb Sullivan. Okay. Now our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your comments to the superintendent for follow-up by her staff. Uh, while we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system is not the proper forum to, to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County, we encourage everyone to utilize existing resolution processes as appropriate. I ask you to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear um, the bell and see the time has expired. Um, I now call on our advisory groups to speak. Uh, and the first one signed up tonight is from the Baltimore County Student Council. That is Ruben Amaya. Hello, members of the board. My name is Ruben Amaya. I will be serving as the Baltimore County Student Council's president for the 2018-2019 school year. Thank you. I just wanted to provide an update on the work of student leadership. Absolutely, student leaders not only work nine months out of the school year, but 365, 24-7. And even though it's summer, and as much as we want to stay in bed, many of us still get up early and represent and work for the students in our county. We've been working on numerous events for the school year, as well as new strategies on how to engage students to speak up about the issues they care about. Because as you see in the news, rarely now it's adults that lead our rallies and marches, but the youth. I want to extend a huge congratulations to Halima for being SMOB. I'm excited about the ideas her and I share, and I look forward to a school year filled with a renewed passion for student voice and advocacy, because we need it now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from Tabco, Abby Baton. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board. I just spent the last two weeks in Minneapolis with thousands of my close educator friends from across the, this nation and even some other countries. Today I am wearing red for ed, specifically to stand up for public education. Not only are educators speaking out in West Virginia, Kentucky, Oklahoma, and Arizona, to name a few, but all over this nation. We are the ones on the ground and the experts in the field. We are fighting for common sense changes for our students. Testing is not an effective tool to measure success. The people who are pushing for tests are those who make lots of money from them. We need to raise a nation of thinkers, collaborators, creators, and dreamers. We do not need to, to teach rote learning. Machines can accomplish that much better than we. For the future, our students need to think creatively and take intuitive leaps as they learn to learn. This past week, we heard from Ted Dintersmith when we were in Annapolis, an education philanthropist with a very different agenda. His latest book, What Schools Could Be, was written after he spent a year visiting every single state in the USA, making sure in each state to visit many different public schools. He expected to be able to tell the teachers what they need to do to teach their students. Instead, he found many teachers who were teaching the necessary tools for their students. Those students were, may not be doing well on the tests, but were learning the skills needed for life. Basically, he said, we must get out of the way and let the experts do it. If we really want our students to learn perseverance, we don't need to test them on it. We need to lead by example and teach them what it looks like why it is important, and to have them work on the process of educating. We are fighting for the lives of our students. We must make changes to the laws demanding teachers teach inappropriately. 
We need your voices added to ours so we can make the difference we need for our students. We have started some of these very ideas here in Baltimore County, but we are hampered by laws that demand testing and role, rote memorization skills to meet the incorrect, outdated, misguided proof of learning that has harmed a generation of students. Please help us stand up for public education. Remember to wear red for ed. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is the PTA Council of Baltimore County, Leslie Weber or Jane Lee. Or both. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Board of Education members, and Ms. White. <clears throat> I'm Leslie Weber, Communications Chair of the PTA Council of Baltimore County, speaking tonight on behalf of our President, Jane Lee, who is elected to serve for the 2018-2020 term in, in, and is un unable to speak tonight for medical reasons. We're aware of, of a proposed resolution to create a, a board subcommittee and a citizens advisory committee on school climate, school behavior, and discipline. We support this resolution since PTA Council believes that teachers can't teach and students can't learn if schools aren't safe, nurturing, and respectful environments. PTA Council urges BCPS to reconsider electing the Community Eligibility Pro Provision, or CEP, at 51 high poverty schools with nearly 27,000 27, eligible students. Tapping into these federal funds would provide free breakfast and lunch to nearly 9,500 um, oh, to, to these 2,700 uh, to these students um, at 19 of the 51 schools for a cost of about a million dollars annually. This is a very small percentage of BCPS's annual budget. All studies show that hungry children cannot function or learn in a beneficial way. We wrote to the BCPS Office of Food and Nutrition ahead of the June 30th deadline advocating for CEP's exp expansion. We now, now know from MSDE that this deadline doesn't apply since BCPS has a CP, CEP pilot program in place. Only four schools are now benefiting from CEP. Our support letter noted that we, as part of National PTA support food programs for children. The National PTA position statement on nutrition for children and families states that the National PTA and, it, and its constituents will continue to work at the local, state, and national levels to enhance the nutritional health of our nation's children and families. We've reached out to the PTA presidents at the 19 eligible schools, encouraging them to support CEP. Please take a closer look at expanding this important program based on data shared with BCPS by Maryland Hunger Solutions and the Student Support Network. We absolutely believe that CEP is a key part of the community school wraparound services model for which we've continued to advocate. Meeting children's most basic needs and supporting their families have proven to create the stability needed to increase academic achievement. PTA Council doesn't take the summer off and will be meeting and planning for another great year of advocacy. We were represented at the National PTA Convention in June, and this coming weekend, we'll take part in the Maryland PTA Annual Convention. Information gleaned from both of these conferences will be shared with our membership. You'll be hearing from us as we listen to our membership and act as their liaison to the Board of Ed. We look forward to working with BCPS and the Board of Ed in the next school year. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Northeast Area Education Advisory Council, and that's Kevin Leary. Good evening, everybody. My name's Kevin Leary. I'm from the Perry Hall School District, which is in the Northeast Area. I am here to um, support Ms. Hen's uh, uh, resolution. Sorry. It's been a long day. Um, <laughs> I wanted to uh, just ask you to please consider it and please vote for it so we can get to work on finding a solution for what's happening in our schools. This past school year was rather uh, tumultuous. We had several incidents that um, I know of. Personally, I spoke to hundreds of students, teachers, and parents and even some SROs about some situations in the schools that aren't being handled properly. I believe this task force is needed. I believe we need to have some students, some parents, and some teachers 
on this task force to be able to get a true representation of what is happening in this in our school system. Um, the bullying epidemic is not going to go away if we don't address it now. Um, it's it's time for action. We have to do this now. We do not want to be the next Broward County, and that's coming if we don't do something. If we don't do something now we will have the same situation that they had in Florida, and we don't want that. We've already had several guns found in our schools this past year. We need to fix this, and uh, now is the time to do it. And if we don't, if we can't work together and um, find a solution, find some common ground to be on, I know um, I, for one, will not stand by and allow any more of the game playing and any more of the just putting off and, and denying what's actually happening in these schools. Um, I just can't. I can't for our students, I can't for our teachers, and I can't for our parents. I have to be vocal and I will be vocal. And um, if I have to, I will go straight up to Annapolis and I will craft some kind of legislation to make it happen this year. Um, so we can either work together and, and do this on a local level, or we can make this an adversarial relationship and I can go to Annapolis and we can fight in Annapolis and make this happen on a local level. Um, it's, it's not, I, I, I am willing and able to work with you on this. I will work for free, I've said it a hundred times. I will help you investigate the issues. I will help you find the problems and help you find a solution to solve them. Just give us a chance and put some parents and, and students and teachers on this task force. Thank you. Thank you. Our next uh, uh, group to speak is, is public comment and our first speaker is Bosch Ferron. Dr. Ferron. Good evening to all. My apology for my appearance. It's a long day too. Um, I want to talk to you today about the First Amendment, our First Amendment. It talks about separation of, and I would say, religion from state. Why really we have First Amendment? It's very simple, because the people in Europe were discriminated against, and they ran away and came here and realized that it's so important for the government not to be involved with religion. So the religion is about faith. You probably already know that, but it's about faith. It's about believing in something is going to come later on and hope that it is true. Um, we talk today about we are one nation and their God indivisible. Is it true we are indivisible? I don't think so, you know, from the discussions. Liberty and justice, really. We have liberty, we have justice, to some degree, but we have plenty of unliberty and not justice. I'm really concerned today about the efforts to silence the four members on my right-hand side, whether I agree with them or not, I'm not taking sides, but I think people need to be able to speak up without being interrupted or talking over each other. Um, First Amendment is about discipline. Discipline. You know, is this board disciplined enough to truly separate religion from its government? The agenda is clear. The calendar basically talks about this school being a religious school. It's very clear. It's a violation of the First Amendment at least. I appeal to you as a citizen for 43 years who came from an area that has been destructed by religions to get rid of religion out of the school system. 
Otherwise, don't call the school system as public school system. Call it by the religion on the calendar, because that's really what it is. Either separate or change the name. I hope you go for separation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Justin Gallardo. Hello, I'm Justin Gallardo. I'm an alum of Perry Hall High School. I went to Kingsville, Perry Hall Middle School, then Perry Hall High School class of 2011. Uh, I'm here today to speak on Ms. Hen's proposal. And I could just say for the whole school system, just one word, and that's disgusted. You know, I didn't grow up uh, with the most quality, I guess, comfort. Um, with the amount of harassment and bullying. Um, I, I was always told just ignore it. And that's not enough. It's not enough and it just ignores a bigger problem. Uh, and it's not getting any better. I mean, just look at the media, look at what's going on uh, with the student body and from the teachers. Uh, I'm really shocked that in an area where we have same-sex marriage, there's a rise in minority representation in the media and the legislatures. Um, and even in the era of Me Too, where people fought back and said, we're not standing up to things like harassment and intimidation, it, it just baffles me. Um, and it's not getting any better with the, um, just the ignorance from the leadership. And that's really what I hope is accomplished in this county. Um, and this is just my way of giving back to my school system. That is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Terry Anderson. Hi, good afternoon. Afternoon, evening. Went into evening, didn't it? <clears throat> Thanks for hearing me. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit. I brought my son last month to the meeting so he could understand the process, how the school board makes decisions. <clears throat> he learned how to be a responsible citizen and student. I, it was a great way to instruct him on how many people have a difference of opinion on a policy, but can work to a responsible, respectable compromise. <clears throat> he also wanted to observe how the policy of the school safety was going to be addressed. It was a great learning experience. It offered me many teachable moments for him. He was engaged, watching the leadership, and was insightful, which is why I'm here tonight. As he listened to Ms. White, he later had questions and comments, as all young people do. His statement was, when she spoke of school climate and safety and talking about the leadership that, you, that she had appointed, what she said he thought was untrue, that not all students have a welcoming, safe learning environment. And he asked why should we make a student statement. Schools are not safe, kids are being harmed, our classrooms are so disruptive you can't learn, much less hear yourself think. You know how many kids have come to me, Mom, not only me, but other kids. I said, son, let's look at it from her perspective. Could it be she is really concerned? She's a mom. She's an educator. Could it be she's done her best, her due diligence, to address the needs of all students when it comes to a safe learning environment? She is part of the process to make the policies based on what's reported to her. Is what's being reported to her the facts? I don't know. But I hope what's being presented to her by her staff, she is adequately up addressing the opportunities. Why wouldn't she? And until recent, you know, we found that some, there were some flaws and forms and things like that, and she put a policy in place or worked on working on the policy. Could it be the data that is now being prepared, um, her team to address it much better? Do you think she has the proper resources? Do you think they have the correct data? Is the team able to address the concerns of what's actually happened? Could it be they could use the board committee and citizens advisor to help? And his response to me was, that's a great solution, but why are we not important enough that when we ask our principals, counselors, social workers, and our school psychologists to help, we're still not being heard or helped? They are in our schools every day and seeing what's happening. And even that night, the board couldn't agree on what Ms. Hinn proposed. All we're asking for is a safe place so we can learn. He said, I think it's a great idea that the board's asking, can other people be involved, students and parents? So I say, could it be my special needs, differently abled son, 
that's been advocating for school safety has a good point. I don't know, but he's watching, learning, and expecting accountability, as I'm sure many other parents and stakeholders are. I hope the board members agree that students deserve a safe environment, and what's being proposed by Ms. Hinn could be a great step in the right direction and changing what we all know is happening in our schools. Our schools are not safe. They're not healthy learning environments. Our next speaker is Josh Landers. <coughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chairman, Ms. White, members of the board. I'm going to take a couple of minutes in support of Ms. Hen's uh, resolution for Student Advisory or Citizen Advisory Council and a Board Advisory Council regarding student climate safety within schools. The laws are clear and they are not in your favor. But it does not mean that we do not have a responsibility to stand up for the children. I'm going to bring a couple facts to light. Four million children per month stay home from public schools in the United States of America as a direct result of bullying. Four million. 4,600 children are going to take their lives this year, and that's only ages 12 through 18, as a direct result of bullying. It is beyond epidemic. It is something that requires all of us to intervene. And I don't just put this on the shoulders of the board the membership or the leadership within the school. I say for all parents, um, stakeholders within this community, we all need to come together. Partisan politics, all of that stuff needs to be put aside. We have a generation of children that we are going to lose if we do not stand up now. And it is not in your favor. I know that it's not. My wife and daughter have visited and spoken to the United States Secretary of Education. I understand the challenges that you are running into. I understand the hardships that you have. There are lots of things that you may not hear at the upper echelon of leadership within BCPS, but there are lots of things that I hear as a parent. I've just withdrawn my children from your school system. They are not safe. Now that is only two children, and I understand that's not the majority, but I would implore you to look beyond where, where you've been looking. I would implore you to put people in place to look at things that you may not have looked at before and to really work to have policies that are safe and effective for your kids. If, if your children were, were in the schools, you would want to do it. And I'm imploring all of you to come together. I know that it's a really hard thing. I know that it's not in your favor. But there are 113,000 students and all of their parents that are depending on you guys and the leadership within the schools to put all of that to the side and make sure that they're as safe as they possibly can. Underreporting has got to stop. SRO influence has got to stop. Um, violence inside of schools has to be addressed and dealt with. Sexual assaults in elementary schools have to be dealt with, not pushed to the side. And they're hard topics. These are hard things. And it is not a whole responsibility of just the folks, but everyone involved. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jay Jimenez. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jay Jimenez. I'm from the American Civil Liberties Union, um, or the ACLU of Maryland. And I'm here to speak on the possible amendment for policy 6307. That's the Pledge of Allegiance or flag salute policy. Section 2B of policy 6307 states, any student or staff member who wishes to be excused from the flag salute shall be excused. This wording has left room for confusion and um, <clears throat> and as recent as a few months ago at Canesville Middle School, um, there, there was confusion on exactly what 
what being excused actually means when um, Mariana Taylor right here to my right was reprimanded for kneeling during the Pledge of Allegiance um, silently, respectfully, without causing a disruption um, in class. Um, so there, there, tends, there seems to be some sort of um, confusion on what kinds of acts of dissent are acceptable during these patriotic exercises in Baltimore County Public Schools. We're hoping that BCPS works towards a clearer policy that, that clearly protects all forms of silent, non-disruptive student protests. We want this policy to remind students, staff, parents that students don't lose their First Amendment rights when they walk through school doors. And that means that silent protest is protected by the Constitution. Um, during all school hours, during all school events, during all patriotic exercises, and that includes the Pledge of Allegiance and um, the National Anthem. The Constitution gives students the right to peacefully dissent during these exercises, whether that means not participating at all, whether it means sitting down, whether it means taking a knee, or any other form of non-disruptive um, silent dissent. We hope that this that newer policy eliminates the risk of future confusion among staff members, but most likely that a clearer policy will prevent students from being inappropriately reprimanded, again, for simply expressing their beliefs. We want BCPS to openly support and applaud students like Mariana, who were brave enough to express their convictions in a non-disruptive manner and who choose to demand better from our nation and our institutions. Um, finally, we just want BCPS to, to be very open about this policy um, or any changes that you may come up with, just so students, parents, teachers are, um, are very aware um, of the constitutional rights of students in the BCPS and in all the whole nation. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Riley. <laughs> Hello, I'm David Riley. I'm here to strongly support Ms. Hen's resolution for um, uh, looking at the problem of school violence, school bullying. Um, I think that as a community leader, I've seen more and more fear and frustration in um, comments, conversations with uh, families in my area um, about this growing problem. I think that schools are the linchpin of stable communities and if we lose those then no, no amount of economic development is going to bring these areas back um, <clears throat> for working families uh, everybody can read the news now they know that uh, you know that they're saddled with health care costs student debt uh, economic uncertainty okay they don't need to lose control of the schools. They don't need when they're worrying about where the next paycheck is coming from to have their kid come in with a black eye or be scared to come to school the next day. So this is something that we need to address uh, before it gets any worse. And again, uh, in the past few months, this is the number one conversation that I'm hearing from a number of my community members. So again, I'd like to just say that I strongly support this resolution and I hope that um, it does become a reality. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is David Rader the second. Hello. Thank Hello. you for giving me thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, my name is Dave Rader. And I am Amaya Rader. And uh, my daughter went to Grange Elementary down in Dundalk in kindergarten. Uh, she was she was stabbed with a pencil, and uh, in the years following, kin uh, first through fifth, she was assaulted by the same person for all six years total. And the, um, the what the administration done about it was uh, it was very little. Uh, obviously, it wasn't enough. And um, my son's going to be, uh, he's going to continue there. And I'm not saying it's the principal's fault. We've had two different principals. I think that there's some kind of policies or something that's preventing them from taking appropriate action. I, I have to believe that these principals care whenever I talk to them. It seems like they do. It just seems like maybe their hands are tied. 
and uh, I think that uh, I think that you I know you all have the power to do more about it and I know that there are there are suicides every year and uh, almost all the mass shootings I think have shown that the kids were bullied so they, they either end up going to one extreme or the other in, in some circumstances and I think that the, I think that the children who take their lives, I think they, they feel like the world is not good enough for them, but really, really, uh, I, I'm sorry, they, they feel like, like they're not good enough for the world, but really the world is not good enough for them. And, and I think it's uh, our job as adults, especially you all, to, uh, to make the world better for them, stand up for them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tam Lynn Kelly. Hi, good evening. My name is Tam Lynn Kelly, and I'm a BCPS parent and an anti-poverty poverty advocate with Maryland Hunger Solutions, a nonprofit that works to reduce food insecurity. Food insecurity occurs when a household has limited or uncertain access to the healthy food they need, and it has been shown to negatively impact health and learning. I'm here tonight because I strongly believe that everyone should have reliable access to the healthy food they need, and because we have the ability to make that a reality for nearly 10,000 students. The school meal programs reduce food insecurity, but action is needed to ensure that all students have access to them. Nearly 50,000 low-income children in BCPS qualify for free or reduced price school meals, and many people assume that all of these low-income children have access to free meals at school. But did you know that less than half of all low-income kids in our school system participate in school breakfast? Milford Mill Academy has over 1,300 students, yet just 100 breakfasts are served each day. Patapsco High has over 1,400 students, half of whom are low income, but just 15% of the low income kids at Patapsco participate in school breakfast. Many low income students can't participate in the school meal programs because their household income is too high to qualify for free meals, yet too low to afford the cost of meals. Did you know that a single parent with one child earning just $22,000 a year does not qualify for free meals? In addition to the barrier of cost, many low-income students do not participate in school breakfast because many schools offer breakfast in the cafeteria before the school day begins, making it inaccessible for the majority of students who have not yet arrived at school. When schools offer breakfast after the bell, attendance, academic performance, and behavior all improve. In fact, offering breakfast after the bell is among the single most impactful policy changes that we could make for the benefit of students. And the community eligibility provision allows for this change to be made more easily. BCPS can expand participation in the school meal funding option called community eligibility provision to 19 schools with nearly 10,000 students and they could all become hunger-free schools. The cost to BCPS for this expansion is just $1 million per year, a cost of just $100 per student. More information is in your purple folders, including a summary of a Johns Hopkins University that was just con uh, concluded that founded that improves attendance rates in CEP schools, and it also found that children in schools that are eligible but not participating in CEP have food insecurity rates that are nearly three times higher than children in schools with CEP. Again, children in schools that are eligible but not participating in CEP have food insecurity rates that are nearly three times higher as compared to children in schools with CEP. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dawn Rader. Dawn Rader. Hello, I'm Dawn Rader. I'm a mother of two and a PTA volunteer, and I'm here today to tell you about bullying. I've been in these schools, I've seen it for myself, it's happened to my children, and the efforts the school board have made were a joke. It's time to take this issue seriously. 6,090 incidences in Baltimore County last year that were reported, how many weren't reported for fear of retaliation or for fear that it wouldn't be taken seriously? 
How many children have to suffer from depression or contemplate suicide or worse, commit suicide before this change is taken seriously? Your policies aren't working. Having a stern talking to doesn't affect these children. They know how their work isn't being graded. They feel like the work they're doing is pointless because it's not being counted for anything. They feel like their voice isn't being heard. And as their peers, they come here and they look up to you for your guidance. But the path you lead them down is leading them into dangerous roads. And with no accountability for their actions, no consequences for acting out, it's a free for all. They need a leader to come and show them that the way they are acting isn't going to get them far in life. Stop setting these kids up for failure and give them the tools they need and the skills that they need to thrive in life. Make their work count, hold them accountable for their actions, listen to them. They are our future and we should be protecting them, not setting them up for failure. Implement a countywide plan of action. It shouldn't be different in every school. And another thing, Hollibird Middle School in Dundalk had 982 students last year and one counselor taking appointments only. How is that fair to the students? What's gonna happen if there's an issue and they need to see somebody? They can't even talk to somebody if they needed to. So, something to think about. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deb Sullivan. Hi, Chairman Gillis, Superintendent White, and school board members, thank you for this opportunity. I'm Deb Sullivan, Baltimore County School alumni, and I've raised three Baltimore County School uh, alumni as well, my children. First, I'd like to thank you for add adding the task force to the resolutions tonight for your agenda. Um, my views are based on 20 years as a Baltimore County parent and school volunteer seven years as a PTA president on all three levels, and six years as a Title I teacher's aide, and as a tax-paying citizen in Baltimore County for over 40 years, and as a community leader who hears from parents and teachers frequently. In my opinion, all students are put in harm's way as soon as they get onto a Baltimore County school bus and as soon as they enter any of the school buildings. Where children from pre-K to 12 are held hostage and on lockdown for a seven to eight hour day. They are subject to bullying, harassment, sexual harassment and assault, and constant disruptions, as you hear at these forums. This is not an education, but rather a disservice to these students and a disservice to the students causing these problems. These students are put in schools that used to govern the students. This is no longer the case. It's my recommendation to parents, if your student is bullied, harassed, or assaulted, be prepared. The school system is not protecting your student. As a parent, it's your job to protect your child. Call 911, file a police report. If you're lucky enough to have the perpetrator's name, give it. Otherwise, give the principal's name and the school's name. Remember, there are currently no regulations in place that are protecting these children. Hopefully, the board, this board, will strongly consider the implementation of this task force for Baltimore County and allow Baltimore County Public Schools to take back their schools. And until then, students have no rights, but as citizens, we do. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Next on our agenda is comments on Board of Education policies. The first policy is uh, policy 6304, uh, commemorations and observances. And signed up speaker is Diana Bergman. Bless you. Good evening. Good evening. So first I want to start by saying is I'm confused about the policy. Is it under first reader, second reader, or third reader? How does this work? Because it keeps changing. So that's my first concern is how we begin when we look at these policies to change them. Because these policies then get implemented in the school day. And as a parent, 
when they change the process around, and I don't know the difference between we're having public comment on the first reader or the second reader, I feel like the process is not being transparent for the parent to share their concerns. I feel like our voice is being suppressed as a parent to share our concerns. I've been coming to the Board of Ed meetings for quite a while. I usually don't miss a lot of them. And I've been paying attention to the policies. They're very important because they play a factor when policies and procedures have to be implemented in the schoolhouse. And there's a process when those policies are not implemented how they're written. And as a parent, you have the right to appeal that process. So I would like to get clarification if the this is a first reader is kind of what I understood, but usually and traditionally before, the part of the comment for the policy has been on the second reader. So I'm just completely lost in the weeds as a parent. Thank you. All right, um, the next uh, policy that is up for discussion is policy 6307, Patriotic Exercises. And our first speaker is Mariana Taylor. Um, hello, my name is Mariana Taylor, um, and I go to Catonsville Middle School. Um, I decided to kneel for the school pledge, um, and when I did so, um, my teacher, she, um, she came up to me, and she told me that, um, well, she basically implied I was um, disrespecting the country. Um, she brought up her family overseas, um, which, um, to my current belief, is that um, she, like, legally, this is not in her rights as a teacher to speak to a student like this. Um, it's a viol um, it is in my rights that I'm allowed to kneel. Um, and from Tinker versus Des Moines, um, one of the cases where um, um, children took a stand in public school, I think it was public schools, um, students are allowed to um, take stands as long as it's not disruptive to the classroom. And I feel that the, um, my confrontation was more disruptive than, um, than kneeling itself. And we need this policy change so other kids don't have to go through it, um, what I went through. I left the classroom in tears. Um, my mom had to come in and we had this big talk where my teacher, well, she basically lied um, to my mom explaining what happened. Um, and. I feel that I have the right to kneel as a student if I don't feel comfortable standing. Because I have the right to kneel. And it seemed like she was giving away her political views very strongly when that's not, that doesn't seem very acceptable for a teacher in a public school to do. I kneel because of the sexism and racism and a lot of wrong things going on in the country. And kneeling um, is not a big disruption to the classroom. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joanne Taylor. <coughs> Hi, I'm Joanne Taylor, mother of Mariana Taylor. Um, and I just wanted to uh, first to share a clear picture in my um, vision what happened. Um, in early February, Mariana had decided to sit during the Pledge of Allegiance. Her homeroom teacher approached her on the first day she sat and asked her why she was sitting. Mariana stated she did not wish to talk about it because it was complicated. After two weeks of sitting, Mariana felt brave enough to kneel instead. On the third day of kneeling, Mariana's teacher approached her once again, stating that Mariana's previous answer was not good enough, that she needed a reason. 
Mariana stated that she was kneeling for things happening in the country. The teacher told Mariana she was disrespecting the country, that she, the teacher, had family overseas, and that Mariana needed to stand for the good things happening in the country. Mariana responded, responded with uncontrollable crying and was allowed to be dismissed from the class in that emotional state. Her second period teacher stopped Mariana at her classroom door and insisted she go to the guidance counselor due to her emotional state. This account is supported by two children who were present in the classroom that day, children of the only two parents I reached out to. I was called by the guidance counselor a short time later because Mariana was unable to calm down. Mariana and I were invited to meet with guidance counselor and the teacher who were both present in the office already. There, I was presented with the teacher's account of what transpired. She reported that she witnessed two boys in the back of the class making faces and that is why she approached Mariana. And because Mariana was so upset about the things going on in the country, the teacher attempted to console Mariana. During this meeting, the teacher suggested several times that Mariana make a presentation to her classmates about why she was kneeling and then give her classmates an opportunity to discuss Mariana's choice. Based on the story I was presented at the time, th that there were particular boys causing a disruption, I agreed to the guidance counselor's suggestion of a community meeting where the guidance counselor would be present. When Mariana arrived home that day, she informed us of the words and statements that had actually caused her to be upset. We immediately emailed the principal and requested a meeting, and we also declined the suggested community meeting. Given the only net reaction, the only negative reaction that day seemed to come from the teacher. Some of the statements in the email um, from the teacher, I mean from the principal, um, were, it is my initial impression that this is a misunderstanding. He has never spoken to Mariana about this. The teacher made comments about the good things happening in our country, like sending people overseas because she was so ups Mariana was so upset about the bad things going on in, a co in our country. I think the teacher had Mariana's best interests interest at heart when attempting to work through the situation. I am awaiting clarification on Superintendent Rule 6307, but from what I can tell, kneeling is not permissible. In closing, I just want to say that uh, the current policy allows for different it allowed for at least three interpretations of Mariana's situation alone. Uh, Mariana is a resilient child who was able to seek support. Another child might not be able to do the same. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Again, I would like to state that for policy 6307, I'm not quite sure if we're in first or second reader for public comments. Um, but pertaining to this policy for 6307, I think it needs to be clarified so there's no uh, multiple interpretations when this is read. Under standards two, I think it needs to be added on D for our students in the JRTC program. These students are potential students that are going to be wearing a uniform entering our branch of service to access an education. They have a responsibility for discipline on how to properly salute the flag and how to wear that uniform um, properly and respect it. So for that particular group participating in the JRTC program, um, if a student decides to kneel in that program, I mean, that gets a bit complicated there. I don't think that students should be also um, held, um, like, like the little student that just spoke up, have disciplinary action, and I think we need to figure out when we do do disciplinary action and when we don't and what the actual process is. But this is one of the main reasons that these policies become very confusing for a parent because we have different staff members throughout BCPS doing different implementation of the same wording that is written in our policies in black and white. Thank you. Our next speaker signed up is Jay Jimenez, but Mr. Jimenez, have you already spoken on this or do you have additional comment? All right, our next speaker then is Dr. Farone, Bosch Farone. Good evening to all. 
I don't understand policies, but I understand applications. So I would like you kindly to think about what I'm telling you when you vote on the policy. What does it mean to be patriotic? Really, what does it mean? So if a citizen shoots a policeman or a woman, for whatever reason, is that patriotism? Of course not. And the opposite to that, a police person shooting a civilian that is not really posing danger, um, that's an issue. Invasion of Iraq, Afghanistan, is that really an act of patriotism? Really? Speaking up, cutting off someone in a debate, speaking over someone, is that an act of patriotism? Standing to the flag. I always stand to the flag. But really, if I decided one day not to, for whatever reason, I'll give you one. Muslim ban one, Muslim ban two, Muslim ban three. I have three reasons not to stand to the flag. Doesn't mean I don't love this country. I'm expressing the First Amendment. So, you know, to me, an act of patriotism, and I really don't know whether the policy applies, is really for you as a board to speak up, to fund the system well, to take care of the issue of the security, to take care of the issue of the bullying, to take care of the issue of testing, to take care of all the other issues that everybody is talking about. To me, this is an act of patriotism. It's not really the words, it's really what we do. And I want to remind you about another act of patriotism, especially we talk so much about bullying. I came to this room for so many years with hundreds, if not really a thousand, asking for equal holiday. One senator came and one politician of BJC came and this board for, voted for the Jewish holidays. You know, where is the patriotism in this? This is about perks, about doing things because we like this one and we hate the other one. You know, so, you know, to me the words mean nothing. When I look at the system and I see problems, I really question, you know, what patriotism means. I ask you really to implement what you believe is right based on what's happening in the community and whether this policy would really fix the problems that we have. If it doesn't fix the problems, then The next policy subject to comment tonight is policy 6500, research and assessment. Diana Bergman has signed up. Greetings for policy 6500 again. I'm not exactly sure if we're in the first reader for public comment, second reader, or third. The whole thing is still unclear and I would like explanation via the email. Um, pertaining to this policy, I think it should be clarified that this is not related to special education services in form of assessments. I also believe that any type of research, testing, and evaluation that Baltimore County provides to every student in Baltimore County to get a baseline should also be accessible for children with a vision impairment. It should be available in um, braille form. Currently, MAPS is one of those assessments we have that's not available from what I was told from some accommodations that my child needed. So it'll be something that could probably be added on to this um, for our students with special education needs if they're gonna do a system-wide type of um, testing or research, those accommodations are made appropriately so they could um, take that um, test. Thank you. Thank you. There was one other policy that was an opportunity for public comment tonight, policy 6800, field trips and foreign travel study programs. No one signed up for it. Next on our agenda is item F, uh, superintendent's report, Mrs. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First and foremost, it is my honor to welcome Halima Adekoya to the board. So welcome, Halima.
Halima was chosen by about 100 middle school and high school student leaders in a forum this past spring. She is a rising senior at Milford Mill Academy, and her leadership experience includes co-founding a female empowerment nonprofit for young girls in the Baltimore area called Dare to Be. Halima is the president of Milford Mills uh, class of 2019, and she is a member of the National Honor Society, the National Technical Society, the Principal's Advisory Board, and the African Student Association. She is also an ambassador of the National Honor Society of High School Scholars. In addition, she works with youth at her church, she sings in the youth choir, and she volunteers with organizations such as Higher Achievement Baltimore, which provides mentoring and academic enrichment for middle school students in Baltimore, which is pretty impressive. So Halima, I look forward to working with you throughout the year and congratulations on your appointment. In terms of web accessibility, you may have noticed a slight different uh, look uh, for our website, as well as uh, more user-friendly access on your mobile device. Uh, we have been working diligently on a multi-year plan to ensure that our web content is accessible to all individuals. And I want to just take a moment to thank our IT department for their leadership as we continue improving accessibility to better serve our entire uh, community. Also, July marks a new fiscal year, and as you know, there is no downtime uh, during the summer for many of our staff. So I want to thank our staff, our teachers, and our leaders who are preparing uh, for schools to reopen through instructional planning and recruiting and hiring, professional learning, and extensive efforts on the instructional and business sides of the house. So thank you so much to our entire team. This school year, uh, as we're looking forward and ahead to this school year, we will tighten our focus on literacy across the disciplines and school climate to make sure that every student is developing the knowledge and skills to succeed in the future and to contribute to our world. Having said that, I will also share a view of the work that lies uh, before us, again, as we're looking ahead to this next school year. And looking ahead, uh, looking ahead, we know that we still have work to do. We always have work to do when it comes to our children. In addition to our work on disciplinary literacy, we will also continue our efforts to address staff and student safety, bullying, as well as parent and student accountability when it comes to student behavior. And let me just say for the record that, again, because I know that I have mentioned this before, that our teachers and administrators and those of us who are in this business, we're in this business because we do love children and that we care for and we, uh, we respect children we honor them first. We serve children first. And so when it comes to that, I know that we have teachers, administrators, and executive staff as well, who where we don't want our students to be bullied, we don't want them to be threatened, we don't want them uh, to, to feel threatened in any way, nor do we want them to be hungry. If that is the case, then we all need to get out of this business. We, need, we are in this business because we care about children and we care about their safety and health, well, well-being. We know that bullying is not a new issue. Many of us were bullied when we were in school. We know that now today our students are facing a greater deal of bullying because of social media and other kinds of things and they're feeling that impact. And so it is up to us to do our due diligence, and as one of the parents said tonight, to make sure that we all share in that responsibility to make sure that we are keeping our students safe. But I believe in our teachers, I believe in our administrators to do the right thing for children, and nor do we want our children to be hungry. So I look forward to working with all of the agencies who have come here tonight to advocate, to make sure that we are providing uh, nutritional services. We are exploring all kinds kinds of ways and options to make sure that we are um, providing those nutritional services for all of our students. We cannot teach, well, I don't know how to teach a hungry child. We have to take care of basic needs first. So just know that that is a priority of this administration, always has been, such as school climate as well, which is why I created the Office of School Climate as a first order of business last July. And as discussed during the July 12th board meeting in 2018, I also talked about how we have two work groups. Uh, we've had two work groups over the course of the last school year specifically to address school safety, 
staff safety and school climate and school discipline and the issue, issues related to that. So to that end, we are going to continue our commitment toward ensuring safe and orderly learning environments. And as the board has been already made aware, I have also created, and to streamline our efforts, the Student Behavior and Discipline Council. And uh, in terms of that discipline council, this will be to streamline our efforts to broaden perspectives through the inclusion of parent, teacher, and student voices to examine system-wide data related to student behavior and bullying, as well as victim support to develop recommendations for system-wide enhancements. Again, the issues aren't new, but they are relevant and they are important, especially if you are the child who is being bullied. And so we want to make sure that we're keeping that at the forefront in terms of a priority of this administration. It always has been and it will continue to be that. The council will also specifically address the school system's actions related to prevention, restoration, and logical consequences related to bullying, student behavior, and school violence overall. Members from the Baltimore County Task Force on School Bullying will also be invited to join the council for continuity and consistency. Additionally, we also know that we have work to do in the area of mathematics. Our trend data suggests that we need to dig deeper to determine how to improve student outcomes in math. To that end, I have asked staff to explore options for an independent review of our math curriculum. Our work will also include continued efforts toward, a, toward balanced instructional environments. As school leaders, we will insist on balanced instruction. That includes face-to-face -face and blended learning opportunities that takes into account the social brain and the need for human interaction. Our teams will also work to tighten safety features to filter inappropriate content. We have heard directly from parents, teachers, and principals and have made this effort, again, a priority as we head into the new school year. Let me be clear, there is no substitute for a quality teacher. And so we applaud our teachers, our instructional assistants, our principals, our APs for working and doing their due diligence to make sure that every student has the benefit of a high quality instructional program. We know that we have nearly 114,000 students, which means we have 114,000 stories and everybody's story is important. So I'm excited about the, the upcoming school year and all that we have coming on our, along our way. Yes, we have work to do, but I've always made the promise that we are going to share the good, the bad, and the ugly with the public because you deserve that as taxpayers. And so in terms of our looking back and as we close out the 17-18 school year, yeah, we want to take back and enjoy and take a look at the last day of school um, courtesy of BCPS TV. So we can launch that now. Thank you. My favorite memory of this year is going to the Gems Club to see Wrinkle in Time. The Gems Club is a, is a club that teaches girls life skills and to um, inspire them. This year I've learned that what's most important to me was that you're always going to be faced with obstacles and that's called life so you're just going to have to persevere through them and you'll make it out. My favorite thing I learned in school this year was how to multiply. Right now I am wrapping up my fifth year here at Gunpowder Elementary School. It has been an amazing experience. This year we rolled out the Virtues Project and I think that was amazing for our students and the families here at Gunpowder. One thing I'm going to remember this year is how nice and lovable my teachers were to me. My favorite memory from the school year was my step team performing at uh, Naples High School. It, got a, it gave them an opportunity to see other teams perform, high school teams, middle school teams, and as an elementary school team, we got a chance to rise to the occasion also. My favorite memory from this school year was when I went to the zoo and saw a giraffe. This year in first grade, my favorite thing was main topics. Main topic is what the story is all about. I'm actually excited to go to high school because I've learned a lot in middle school from my avid teachers about how high school is and how 
it's gonna help me for college. One of my favorite thing I did this year was when I learned about I learned about pollinators and I went to Carmel Valley and I learned about all these pollinators and I had a really fun time. One of my favorite memories from this year is with the program I've been honored to start here at Gunpowder, the Gents Mentoring Club, and it is where I work with young men and we play basketball and we talk about the trajectory to college and career readiness. One of my favorite memories is when they surprised me this year at the farewell assembly. Each young man handing me a, a flower and a card and talking about that. Mm As a first year teacher, it's hard to pick just one memorable moment. I mean, just seeing how much progress my kids have made since the first day of school, um, hearing some of them talk and say new words for the first time, learning new functional skills, and just having fun. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That is my report. Great. Uh, next on the agenda is item H, Chair's report, and I have a few comments. First, I hope that summer 2018 is affording time for our teachers, our administrators, and our support staff to recharge their batteries so as to be fresh and ready to do amazing things just after Labor Day. Uh, second, I want to also welcome on behalf of the board, Halima Adekoya. We are all so impressed with our student board members and we look forward to Halima's important participation this school year. And Halima's principal is here. Way to go. <laughs> nice. Uh, third, uh, there has been much uh, BCPS activity since our board last met. Uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, the system hosted uh, two days of uh, safe schools conferences uh, organized by April Lewis. Um, great successes and great important mission to make certain that there is a, a, a safe school. Uh, Baltimore County Public Schools keeps school safety in the fore. Uh, County Executive Moeller, uh, like County Executive Kamenetz before him, is a strong supporter and the 2018-2019 budget includes more funding for school resource officers. Uh, BCPS was also recognized for a third consecutive year as a common sense district. Uh, not only physical safety is important, but digital safety is as well. And this national pro nonprofit called Common Sense uh, recognizes the Baltimore County Public School Systems for its commitment to creating a culture of digital learning and citizenship. Fourth, uh, there has been much attention uh, these past days on school discipline. And on behalf of the board, I have encouraged Mrs. White to create a council where uh, the board and the system can work together hand in hand to address community uh, partic uh, uh, participation and, re and reality regarding school climate and discipline. In my view, the council that Mrs. White just described with the participation by board members, by administrators, by teachers, by the community that is parents and students will afford an opportunity for all interested parties to sit at the table together. Because we're all in this together, and we all have the same desired end, which is to make certain that schools are a safe place. And I believe that hand in hand, we can and will succeed. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Halima Adekoya, our student board member, for her first report. Good evening, everyone. I am Halima Adekoya, your student member on the Board of Education for Baltimore County for the year 2018-2019. I am very excited and honored to be a part of a phenomenal cohort that is focused and geared towards providing over 114,000 students with a world-class education, preparing them to be globally competitive citizens in a diverse and multifaceted world. As a board, I believe our main focus and goal should be to consistently make sure we provide for the students. The students are our top utmost priority as we are their governing body. It is essential that no voice goes unheard regardless of gender, age, or socioeconomic background. It is important as a community, I believe, we must have each other's back. From the students being our first priority, to teachers receiving the best training and resources, to administrators having support and understanding. 
Students, as your student member, I am here for you. I promise to be your voice, to listen and to adhere to what you all have to say and be the bridge between the board and you. Thank you for trusting me with advising the board on your thoughts and feelings. Always remember to dare to be a voice and not an echo. Let us prepare to have a great school year. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item I, and that's the Board Policy Review Committee report. Mr. Virch. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of our board, our Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that our board accept this report of your committee's recommendations to amend the following board policies. Now, before I say the policies, I'll just mention Policy 4008, Data Governance, uh, review of certain language in it um, with the person who suggested it during the Policy Review Committee um, suggests that perhaps it should come back to the Policy Review Committee, and I'll give you some more details on that after I give you these three for us to currently vote upon. Uh, so the recommendations to amend the following board policies. Policy 1270, Parent and Family Engagement. Policy 4002, Obligations of Employees of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. And Policy 4010, Nepotism. The proposed amended policies are presented to you on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit uh, I. Our committee's considered, considered public comment received at the board's June 12, 2018 meeting. All right, thank you, Mr. Virch. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the board's policy review committee regarding policies 1270, 4002, and 4010? So There's no second required. Mr. Uh, Chair, can we pull out uh, number four? Well, we will, yes, we will, nepotism. Uh, so now the motion is concerning 1270 and 4002. Uh, all in favor, please raise your hands and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Any opposed? Abstain? One abstention. All right, now, 4010. There's a motion, but Mrs. Miller wants discussion. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I believe that this policy uh, really needs to uh, include a requirement for approval of the board for any and all exceptions to the board policy. Right now, it states that the, uh, the exceptions um, can be made by the superintendent, but this is a board policy, and I think that if we um, allow exceptions to board policy by the superintendent, it kind of negates the purpose of a board policy. Um, so I, I'm going to propose that we, um, well, I'll go ahead and make a motion uh, that uh, we approve this policy with the following amendment, and that is to delete subparagraphs 4A and B and replace it with language that states, the board reviews and considers any and all exceptions to this policy after a review by the chief human resources officer and the superintendent. And just to speak to that a little bit more. Well, let's see if there's a second on that motion to amend. Is there a second? Second. All righty, now discussion. Uh, yes, just to speak to that a little bit more, the, um, that still allows for input and review by HR and the superintendent, but ultimately it leaves the decision in the hands of the board where a board policy really should reside. All right, further discussion. I'd like to just remind everyone that the board makes policies and the superintendent makes rules based on those policies, so the superintendent acts often uh, in concert with or consistent with board policy. Mr. Virch. Thank you, Ed. Um, just by way of background, um, currently we have 20,000 employees, and under existing policy, the board reviews and considers any exceptions concerning the employment of a family member of the superintendent, which means of the whole universe of family members of employees, a little slice right now, those being the family members of the superintendent, are those, that exceptions would be considered by the board 
itself. All the rest of that universe currently, that's done right now um, by the Chief Human Re Resources Officer with the approval of the superintendent. Now, in that process, ultimately, anything can come before the board, and by the board's own inherent power, the board can overturn decisions of the superintendent, whether it be formally through an appeal process or to the extent the board decided to say, don't do X, or, you know, you shouldn't proceed in this fashion. So, where I'm going with this is, the question for us, I think, is not so much a authority question, because the board has the inherent authority. The question is this, of a universe of 20,000 families and all those folks in it, whether the board wants to, from a workability perspective, be the final arbiter of whether or not an exception should be made for nepotism purposes. That's solely the question I, as I see it right now. The board has a lot of things to contend with, a lot of things to deal with, and in a system the size of ours, what is the next step to begin selecting the particular grade of graphite, uh, or le yeah, graphite to be used in mechanical pencils, to choose tile for particular floors? So that's really the question that I think is before the board with an amendment. Do board members want to be the final arbiters of the rest of the universe, because right now, the board already has said specifically, the one employee we specifically contract with, the superintendent, we're gonna take an eye and keep a look on any family members of hers with regard to employment, promotion, and all the other items listed in this policy. So for me, legally, the authority is already with the board. It's whether the board wants that primary responsibility for making that decision at the very lowest levels of this sizable 20,000 employee organization. It'll be whatever majority of the board would like, but I think that puts it in a frame for the members to view and decide whether that should be within the realm of governance of the board. Mrs. Henn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I understand my colleague, Mr. Virch's concerns about workability. However, I don't believe we can compare flooring decisions with nepotism exceptions. I believe that I will be supporting uh, Mrs. Miller's um, recommended amendment on the basis that we need visibility into these exceptions and that they should be few and far between, which addresses any concern about workability. Mrs. Miller. And just to add on to that, I, I believe that that really is the case because we're leaving, the motion leaves in that it would be after a review by HR and the superintendent. So they'd take care of, you know, if I mean, hopefully there wouldn't be a lot of these kinds of cases of nepotism, but um, they, were, they would be the first line of review. And so the only ones that would come before the board then would be ones that uh, that both HR and the superintendent choose to you know request as an exception. Further discussion. Yeah, I'd like to just finish my thought if I could. Um, so if the board sets a policy, and I want to respond to Mr. Virch's comment that this is not about authority, I disagree. If the board sets a policy and says we're not going to allow for nepotism, but then we give away that authority and says but it can be overruled by the superintendent. That is very much a matter of authority. Mr. Ver uh, Mr. Virch, Mr. Uhlfelder. Thank you. Um, to have the board uh, make a final decision on an HR procedure is very dangerous. As you are aware, uh, HR and all our employees come under personnel guidelines, which means they're not publicly discussed. And if we take the position that we are going to review any decision relative to some exception to this very detailed policy, I think is going to create a situation uh, where we will be in a position to discuss family personnel things that normally we are not allowed to discuss in public. 
And I think we will set a very poor policy. We will probably strangle ourselves uh, with, with trying to find a way to review these uh, in some closed situation. Uh, I'm, I'm dead set against it. I think that the personnel policies and personnel decisions should be up to our director of personnel, our HR director. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In listening to the discussion, I guess one of the questions that I have is how many exceptions are made regarding employing family members of employees? How is it recorded now? And I would also say that um, relative to Mr. Ufelder's point about the Board of Ed making um, dangerous HR decisions is that we do currently review very quickly in our uh, closed sessions personnel issues uh, that are listed out for us uh, by our staff so that we do do those things now. So my question is, is how is it handled now? How is it recorded? And how many of them are there? Do we have someone from HR that can give us some guidance? Hi, good evening. So as part of our onboarding process for new employees, there is a form that um, employees are obligated to complete that is part of the policy um, should they have a family member that works in the system and it um, would identify where that family member works and what the relationship is using the chart that's part of the policy. That form then goes to our HR director and so he reviews that policy. So if the employee is um, going to a position where the family member would supervise that employee directly, then um, that's what we then have to review to determine whether or not we then have to make a move with one of those employees. So for example, if we place a principal at a school where they have a family member, um, we would then need to move that family member, um, transfer that family member to another location because the principal cannot directly supervise that family member. So that's how it is regulated now. Um, should there be um, a case where there is not immediate direct supervision, um, it's a secondary supervision, that's when it is then bumped up to our chief and he makes the decision whether or not it would be appropriate for that person to remain in that position, but it really is directly related to whether or not there is immediate supervision. There could be someone in an office, but they have, they do not supervise the individual. They're not responsible for um, their evaluation in any way. Um, there's somebody else who is the direct supervisor. So that's usually what is used to determine whether or not that would be an appropriate placement. Well, thank you for that explanation, but one of the issues that I'm still concerned about given that explanation is our policy also deals with hiring, favoritism in hiring. And what it sounds like is that the relationship, the family relationship might not be known until after they're hired and part of the onboarding process. Mm -hmm. So it seems that there's a step that's missing in terms of identifying a family relationship that that may have provided favoritism in the hiring process. It would be identified prior to the offer. So. So how is that done? So it's, so it's not I'm part of onboarding? within Baltimore County who wants to transfer to a position. So part of that process is they, our policy states that if you know that you have an employee um, within the system that is a relative of yours, you may not work under them right now. It is your obligation based upon this policy to fill out that form. So we have um, employees that, um, get married and married into a family. And so upon that, they complete the form. They, one person may work in a school, another person could work in food service, they never cross paths. But that form is sent to our director and he uh, maintains those forms. Um, it's in the employee's file. And so when we review a file to hire someone, um, we have that file in place, and it is also part of the process when we are bringing someone on to a new position again, whether it's a new hire or a transfer, to engage in that conversation and reminding them of that policy. 
<coughs> so if it's a new employee outside of our system, it is part of the onboarding process. And just a point of order, when you said it is our policy, you were really referring to the specifics of the current rule, the current rule that interprets the policy. Yes. Very good. Further discussion? Yeah, just to follow Mrs. up Miller. on that. Sure. Um, so how many times would you say that we uh, require an exception? I don't know in the past three years that I've been in HR that we've made an exception or that we've been in a position where we had to make one. Um, I can tell you that in my experience in Baltimore County, 30 plus years, I know of very few that are made. Um, and it generally, um, I, w I would think you would really be talking about an extreme situation where someone has a very specific skill set. Um, and I think, again, we would have to um, truly identify what we were going to do to work around that um, as far as the appraisal process is concerned so that there is no possibility that you would be evaluating your family member. Yes, All thank right. you. So, so that would be a very rare thing and would mm -hmm. hardly constitute a hardship on the board to review something that might happen once every three years at the most. All right, so the motion is to amend the Policy Review Committee's recommendation on Policy 4010 uh, to either delete 4A and B or to amend 4A and B to require review by the board. All in favor of that motion to amend, please raise your hand. I'm sorry, could I, could we have Ms. Miller state her motion because that, that's not clear what you stated. I'll restate it. Um, to, that the board would approve policy 4010 with the following amendment, deleting subparagraphs 4A and B and replacing them with the following language. The board reviews and considers any and all exceptions to this policy after a review by the chief human resources officer and the superintendent. All right, all in favor of that motion to amend, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, all opposed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The motion fails. Now the motion before us is policy 4010 is recommended by the Policy Review Committee. All in favor of that, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Opposed? One, two, three, four. The motion carries. Um, policy is amended. Now we're back to Mr. Virch and policy 4008. Uh, thank you, Ed. And uh, directing uh, our members' attention to policy 4008 and a specific line on uh, page one. It's under two, the definitions, uh, and those would be between lines 20 and 23. Um, on a uh, chilly night in February, I was sick in bed and was not here. I apologize again for the Policy Review Committee's uh, meeting that evening. And um, uh, presented to the Policy Review Committee was an expanded definition of authorized users. That had been prepared by staff pursuant to a prior meeting of the Policy Review Committee when uh, committee member uh, David Yulfelder had asked uh, that uh, the term outside affiliates be included uh, in uh, the definition of authorized users. Now, it, I would just push the pause button to say data governance is a pretty significant matter. I won't even use the word pretty. I'd say it's a significant matter for all of us. And defining the authorized users is a key part of this policy. That being the case, when we look at the term outside affiliates, we look at the definition of affiliates not as the transitive or intransitive verb, but as the noun that it is, an affiliate is something that is part of a greater whole. So then, how can it be both part of a greater whole and be outside? Well, it can't. So, uh, as important as the policy is, what I recommend, having talked with David, uh, who had proposed it, was that it simply come back to the Policy Review Committee and that this authorized user's language be reviewed and clarified so that we don't have contradictory words next to each other. Outside affiliates, either something is 
within and it's an affiliate or it is outside and it is not. And that's what I uh, I'll suggest. i that as a motion to re, uh, uh, return the uh, policy 4008 to the Policy Review Committee. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on that? Mrs. Causey. Um, I would just say that we've been working on this policy and it's really a mission critical policy. Microphone. Thank you. Um, I would just like to say we've been working on this policy for quite some time and it is, as Mr. Virch points out, not just very important, it is mission critical. Data, as we know in our society, is under attack and it also is vital to every aspect of a person. And we're taking care of children. We have uh, control of information that is very, very uh, private, very, very important. And I do not want to see this uh, be delayed. I would just suggest that we take out the word outside and that we include the, U, the word affiliates. And if the policy needs to be refined, then we can add it back to the policy review committee cycle. Um, but this is a policy that really should be updated. And I would um, suggest that we vote down the motion to pull it back to PRC and then have a motion just to remove that word outside and then pass the, uh, pass the policy. And if upon further reflection you want to remove affiliates, that we bring it back to PRC at that point. But this policy, um, let's go back and see when the last time it was updated, um, in 2014, so that was four years ago. And in the realm of data technology, um, that's really a long time. Mr. Virch. Uh, thank you so much. I took the liberty of looking at the specific definition for affiliate. I took the liberty of looking for the specific definition of affiliate. And that's where the rub comes in. Because when we look at affiliate, an organization that is a member of a larger organization, and when speaking with David, his concept was not something from within, hence the use of the word outside. So, when we then ask staff, can you identify an affiliate? Well, who's, what is an affiliate? We've already identified the board, board employees, approved consultants, independent contractors, volunteers. David's effort was to make sure that we had, that we had identified authorized users properly to make sure we had not excluded anyone. And when I you know, ran past uh, the, the general counsel, the concept of certain government organizations, because right now that's not included in there, one can argue on page two where we make specific mention of federal, state, and local laws that we have to comply with, we would somehow be in compliance. But because of the mission critical nature of it, you are absolutely right. Why should we guess and fidget and think, well, maybe we can come back later and fix it? Let's get it done right the first time, rather than allow any loopholes that might come back and burn us, or worse, burn any of our students or their families. Right. Further discussion on Mrs. Causey. My concern is we have done this to policies before, including discipline policies that were pulled back over a year ago and have not been brought back to Policy Review Committee. They have not been brought back to the full board. So my concern is when is this policy going to be addressed? We don't have a meeting, policy review committee meeting in August. And so if you want, then we can put down the motion to send it back to PRC, take out outside affiliates, pass it the way it is. And if you want to consider it over the month that we are not in session and bring it back in September. But again, this policy is over four years old in an area of data technology that is moving rapidly. I think it's, uh, I think it is, not the wise thing to do to not move this forward and then have it be in place to protect our students, their data, and everything that's going on in our system. Further discussion? Mrs. Miller. Yes, I, I agree with Ms. Causey. I'm not understanding the issue with the words outside affiliates or what the confusion is, but I, I think if we can move forward and get this revised as is any tweaking can occur in months to come. 
Further discussion on the motion to return this policy 4008 uh, to PRC. All in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. One, two, three. The motion fails. All right, so do you want to make a motion to remove the word outside? I make a motion to remove the words on line 22 and outside affiliates and move the word and in between contractors and volunteers, removing the hanging comma. Is there a second? Second. All right, any discussion on that? Mr. Yulfelder. Well, my only, my only discussion would be how would you define uh, the Baltimore County government as, as an affiliate so perhaps just removing the word outside would suffice. Ed? Well, respectfully, David, um, uh, county government is not a subset or under the rubric or part of. That's the hang up with the word affiliate. So um, if the sense of the board tonight is it's better to have something than not to have anything different, well then, we should proceed forward, but we respectfully can't use a word that doesn't meet the need. Further discussion? Mrs. Causey. Do employees from the Baltimore County government have access to our data, or do they receive reports that are generated from our staff and given to them? I see Mr. Corns over there. Mr. Riali, please. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, sir, so um, affiliate in this case, I believe, was meant to encompass the government agencies. So when it comes to uh, the Baltimore County Public Library, uh, there is a data transfer that occurs. That's our ability to have this work at all of our public libraries for our students. Uh, we also have uh, the Baltimore County Health Department. We have state agencies, such as the Maryland State Department of Education as well. So. The understanding around this language was about those outside entities, affiliates. That's what my understanding was this language was put in here for. And Mrs. Miller. I'd like to suggest that maybe we just change the word outside affiliates to government agencies. If um, Ms. Causey would consider amending her amendment. Mr. Imbriali, would that cover it, government agencies? There's no private agencies that we provide in data access to our data that are not, we, we already have independent contractors covered, approved consultants. Correct, approved consultants and independent contractors are covered in the line, I believe it's line 21. Mm -hmm. So line 22 here is talking about government agencies. I wanna be careful that I'm not missing someone that may not be a government agency. Okay. Mr. McDaniels. Mr. Embriali used the word entity. Is that a word that would be broader than government agency to cover? I mean, is that too broad? Outside entities? <laughs> Mr. Birch. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, I do know what is, what is being modified here at the end in lines 22 and 23 is who have been permitted access to board data. Whether we should change who out with the word which certainly could occur, which have been permitted access to board data, which means whatever they the are. entities are, if they've been permitted access, then access can occur. If they haven't, and obviously the, the reverse, if they haven't permitted access, then they don't get any, or they're not supposed to have any. So perhaps that may just be the best way to read it. Uh, after contractors insert the word and, that then is followed by volunteers, and outside affiliates, who is all deleted, and the word which is inserted for who. Mr. Young. And Thank you. Can we 
um, with the addition of and gov adding the governmental government agencies also put the statement in there and others who have been determined or approved by um, the board or super and or superintendent. Could you so, say it one more time so, so I can hear the whole thing? So let's I, let's uh, let's focus instead of keeping to changing this to focus on the motion that's on the table now, um, and perhaps this discussion means that you want to vote one way or the other on the motion. But the motion is to delete outside affiliates and to shift the end to be four volunteers and add a comma. Correct. Correct. Yes, and I'm going to withdraw my motion. Okay, so we've withdrawn that motion. So is there a motion? Mrs. Causey. I'd like to make a motion to change line 22 to state volunteers and, excuse me, starting over again, sorry. Um, line 22, volunteers, comma, government agencies, and others who have been permitted access to board data. Government. I'll second that. Government agencies, did you say? Yeah, you say right. Right. Government entity agencies and others. All right, any discussion on that motion? All right, so there's a motion to amend the PRC's recommendation to uh, change line 22 to say, and government agency and agencies and others who have been. All in favor of that amended policy Four zero zero eight. Please raise your hand. It appears to be unanimous. Oh. Everyone raised his hand. Or thank you hand. very much. Thank you, Mr. Embriali. Thank you, Mr. Corns. Thank you. All right. Next on our agenda is uh, personnel matters, and we invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. I would like um, consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, deceased recognition of service, and certif certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits J1 to 5? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hands. On the, it is, uh, are you opposed? Okay. <laughs> uh, one, it's uh, 11, yes. All right. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Next on the agenda, item K, administrative appointments, Mrs. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Gillis, members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following of administrative appointments. Principal, Cadenceville Elementary School. Principal, Johnny Cake Elementary School. Principal, Summit Park Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Baltimore Highlands and Lansdowne Elementary Schools. Assistant Principal, Bedford and Powhatan Elementary Schools. Assistant Principal, Campfield Early Learning Center. Assistant Principal, Dundalk High School. Assistant Principal, Franklin Middle School. Assistant Principal, Golden Ring Middle School. Assistant Principal, Martin Boulevard and Oliver Beach Elementary Schools. Assistant Principal, Milford Mill Academy. Assistant Principal, Northwest Academy of Health Sciences. Assistant Principal, Pleasant Plains Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Randallstown Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Relay Elementary School. Assistant Principal, Sollers Point Technical High School. Coordinator, Compliance, Office of Special Education. Director of Governmental Relations and Constituency Services. Pupil Personnel Worker and Specialist, five, um, specialist for Homeless Education. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments presented in Exhibit K? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hands. It is unanimous, 11 to nothing. Um, it's back to you, Mrs. White. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to congratulate and to recognize the following, following administrative appointments. I would ask that they stand or wave <laughs> <laughs> along with their family members so that we can recognize and celebrate them. The first, I'd like to recognize Duane, as we know, Tony um, Baysmore, who will be the new Director of Governmental Relations and Constituency Services. There he is. Congratulations, Tony. Do you have anyone here with you this evening? Um, my wife is home with the new grandbaby. So okay. 
Very good. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'd also like to recognize Jordan Birnbaum, Assistant Principal, Franklin Middle School. Congratulations, Jordan. Do you have anyone here with you this evening? My wife, Stephanie Very good. Congratulations. <laughs> Stephanie Fanshaw, new assistant principal, Golden Ring Middle School. <laughs> Congratulations, Stephanie. Do you have anyone here with you this evening? Yeah, my husband, Greg. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations to Melissa Forster, specialist, Homeless Education Office of Title I. Melissa, do you have anyone here with you this evening? Very good. Congratulations. I'd like to recognize Courtney Griffin, Assistant Principal, Bedford Elementary and Powhatan Elementary Schools. Who do you have here with you this evening? I have my principal, Dr. Montgomery, and my husband, Justin, and my daughter, London. Very good. Congratulations. Not yet, she's not here. I'd also like to recognize Megan Isbell, Pupil Personnel Worker. <laughs> here with you this evening. And I have my husband and my two brothers and my mom. They're all good. Very good. <laughs> Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Thomas Long, Assistant Principal, Milford Mill Academy. here with you this evening. And my wife, Kendale. Very good. And <laughs> congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Danielle Maddox, Assistant Principal, Northwest Academy of Health Sciences. <laughs> now, who do you have here with you? <laughs> congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Daniel Martz, Coordinator of Compliance, um, Office of Special Education. <laughs> Who do you have here with you? Very good. Congratulations. <laughs> We'd also like to congratulate Sean McComb, Assistant Principal, Pleasant Plains Elementary School. <laughs> Sean, would you like to introduce your family? I'm joined by my wife, Sarah, and our daughter, Sadie. Very good. Congratulations. Congratulations also to Brandon Mendez, Assistant Principal, Campfield Early Learning Center. And do you have anyone here with you this I'm evening? Here with my husband, Mike. Very good. Congratulations. So, congratulations to Kathleen Murray, Principal, Summit Park Elementary School. <laughs> Kate, do you have anyone here with you this evening? Congratulations. <laughs> I'd like to recognize Brian Oliver, Pupil Personnel Worker. <laughs> oh, he's all the way over there in the corner. Hi, Brian, over there in the corner. Do you have anyone here with you this evening? <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> We'd like to also recognize Jennifer Pilarski, Assistant Principal Martin Boulevard and Oliver Beach Elementary Schools. <laughs> and do you have anyone here with you this evening? Congratulations. <laughs> so I'd like to recognize Chara Patera, Assistant Principal Relay Elementary School. Anyone here with you tonight? I do. I have my children, Griffin, Bailey, Haley, and Ashley, and my mom. Wow. <laughs> I have my former principal, Lori Phelps, and my current principal, Lisa Barnett. <laughs> Very good. Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Melissa Powers, principal, Catonsville Elementary School. <laughs> Melissa, do you have anyone here with you tonight? Very good. Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Lindsay Rattet, Assistant Principal at Dundalk High School. I 
have anyone here with you this evening? Very good. Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Michelle Valario, assistant. Anyone here tonight? Very good. Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Lori Whitney, Assistant Principal, Baltimore Highland and Lansdowne Elementary Schools. <laughs> do you have anyone here with you tonight? I do. I have my former principal, Lori Hutchison, my former assistant principal, Jen Bell, and my former Excellent. <laughs> Congratulations. I'd also like to recognize Marcus Wimberly, new pupil personnel worker. Congratulations, Marcus. Do you have anyone here with you? Uh, yes, my wife Tiffany is with me. Congratulations to you. Mr. Chair, I would also like to recognize those who are not, who couldn't be in attendance tonight, but to celebrate them as well. We have Patricia Collins McCarthy, who will be the new principal of Johnny Cake Elementary School. Nancy Loyal Lo Lo Cano, I'm, I'm not sure I messed that up, I apologize, Nancy, who will be a new per pupil personnel worker. Patricia Little, who will be a, a pupil personnel worker as well, as well as Leah Warble, who will be the new assistant principal at Sellers Point Technical High School. So congratulations to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Next on our agenda is item L, but I'll give it an opportunity for Next is item L, and I'll give an opportunity for the room to clear out a little bit. All right, we'll get Mr. Virch back up here. Okay. All right. All right, next on the agenda is item L, uh, the interim superintendent's contract. Do I have a motion to approve the contract? Seconded. All right, any discussion? All in favor of the uh, contract, please raise your hand. Oh, actually, hold on, I'm Mrs. Sorry. Miller has. I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to to say that I I believe that the the uh, contract is far from perfect, but I will be supporting it as well um, because I view the approval of the employment contract to be separate from the approval of the hire and. Um, I would have liked to have seen a prohibition on, in the contract on certain memberships regarding technology-related organizations, such as ERDI, which was a, 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 an issue. Um, but uh, I know how that's going to turn out, so uh, I'm going to support the, the contract. All right. Any further discussion? The question is uh, uh, approval of the uh, interim superintendent's contract. All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Opposed? One, two, S abstain? One. The motion carries. This, the contract will be signed. And uh, congratulations, Mrs. White. Thank you. All right, next on our agenda is item M and for that I call upon Mr. Stewart. Very good. 
Earlier this evening, the members of the Building and Contracts Committee met to consider items M1 through M12, and uh, this committee voted to recommend approval by the full board of each of those items, M1 through M12. All right. Do I have a motion to approve items M1 through M12? So moved. Is uh, no need for a second because it comes Mr. from Yellis. the committee? Mrs. Could, Miller. I've just got a couple questions, and, and then we could probably do them all. But um, I have questions on number two and number five. All right. Let's, uh, let's vote on the others, and then we'll have questions on two and five. So the motion now is M1, M3, M4, M6 through 12. Mr. Young. Can we still vote on them as a block, but yet I abstain from number nine? Yes. And I'm abstaining from seven, eight, and ten. All right. So we have those abstentions. Any further discussion on M1, M3, 4, M6 through 12? All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's unanimous. Now, item two, Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, just had some questions on this. Um, if we can have staff come up. Uh, this one is for the PD in the uh, for in applied behavioral analysis. And I wanted to ask: Is this for students in the BLS program? Doctor. Good evening. Um, this will be for staff in multiple self-contained programs. It'll be the behavior learning support programs as well as the communication and learning support classrooms. Communication and learning support. Can you describe the difference there? Sure. The communication and learning support classroom typically serves students with autism. The behavior and learning support classroom um, support students that have behavioral needs, different codings. The students in the behavior learning support classroom have, um, are working towards a diploma. In most cases, the students in the communication learning support classroom are receiving a certificate. Okay. So uh, is it similar in that this is an, um, students that aren't integrated for both of those programs? Yes, they're self-contained programs, but they um, in many cases are housed within comprehensive schools. Okay. And what is the crossover? Where do they integrate? Is there any times that they integrate? It would be dependent on the student's individualized education program on their IEP. Okay. Um, it also describes social emotional learning classrooms. Can you explain what they are? That's the currently called behavior learning support classroom. It's the same. Okay, so that's that's the BLS. Okay, and um, are both the grants um, that are providing the funding, are they federal grants, both of them? Yes, I believe they are. <laughs> yes, all three grants listed in the last bullet are federal grants. Okay, and what is local priority special ed? That's a grant also. That's a part of the, um, the overall Individuals with Disability Education Act grant, and it's one of the subsets of that $28 million umbrella grant. Okay. okay. All, All right. right. All Thank in you. favor of contract M2, please raise your hand. It's unanimous, 12 to nothing. Now, contract M5 is the last one. Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, if the existing contract expires in 2020, when does this new contract become effective? Is it going to take over in 2020 or is it going to take over right away? Uh, it will take over right away. We'll terminate for convenience the existing contract. Okay. And the spending authority is 780000 but it shows that annual expenditures were 100 and something, 107, I think. Yes. Uh, for, so it's for a five-year term. So why is it 780000 instead of 535000 
Good evening, everyone. Mrs. Miller, the original contract was meant to spend $169,000 a year, but the vendor was unable to provide some of the services. So because of the services they couldn't provide, they reduced their fee, and that's why we spent less. But as we move into the new contract, we actually will spend about $159,000 a year because the new vendor can provide the needed services. Okay, thank you. All right, all in favor of Contract M5, please raise your hands. It is unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Saris. You did a great job. Next on our agenda is item N, uh, consideration of the privately funded capital request, installation of a scoreboard for the upper field at Parkville High School. Ms. Byers. So good evening, Chair Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. Tonight I'm bringing forward for approval a privately funded capital improvement co uh, project for the installation of a scoreboard on the upper field of Parkville High School. This project is being funded by the Parkville High School Booster Club, as well as through a donation from the Parkville High School class of 2015. The total cost for this project is $17,477. It's reflected in the quotes in your package from Dactronics um, for the scoreboard and WJ Strickler signs for the installation. In accordance with policy 7330, this request has progressed through all of our normal appropriate review processes. Do I have a motion to approve the installation of a scoreboard for the upper field at Parkville High School? So moved gladly by the representative from the 6th District. Is there a second? <laughs> second. Any discussion? Yes, I'd just like to commend the Parkville Athletic Booster Club <laughs> and the outstanding class of Parkville High School 2015. 2015. There you go. All right, uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. It's uh, unanimous. Thank you, Ms. Byer. Thank you. Next is... Uh, first Reader's Policy Review Committee Report, Mr. Virch. Let me turn this on. Mr. Chair and members of our board, our Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asks that our board accept this report of your committee's approved proposed amendments to the following board policies. Policy 3111, Budget Planning and Preparation. Policy 3133, Transfers and Supplements. Policy 3121, Funds Management and Classification of Expenditures. Policy 5200, Promotion and Retention. These recommendations are presented to you on uh, tonight's agenda as our Exhibit O. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the Policy Review Committee? So moved. Second. Right. Discussion I have a question. Mrs. Miller. Um, so this is first reader. First reader. Will we then have a second reader that the board votes on on these policies? The second reader will be public comment. And the vo board votes on third reader. So that's a change from what we've done previously. No. We've always voted to move it forward from first to second to third. No, we vote the introduction here, and then we have public comment, and then we vote on the third. Okay, so, uh, so I understand the process, because we recently had a change in a policy that said that the board gets an opportunity to comment at second reader. But if it's not on the agenda for the board to discuss it, when will the board have discussion on policies and uh, yeah, to just to answer that one, if you could. Uh, the policy was, um, for want of a better term, uh, laid over for additional review. So any changes to that policy, which um, as I recollect, and staff may know more, but as I recollect, there was concerns about providing shorter deadlines for our many involved stakeholders to be able to comment and that would have caused perhaps not enough time for folks to review, and then that would have then led to additional opportunities for extended comment afterwards if it changes were incorporated. But that change to have discussion during second reader, um, that, that policy change didn't take effect. Okay, so at this point, it's not really defined, so the board could comment either when we vote for f at first reader or at third reader. And that is not a conclusion I can agree with. But there's nothing that precludes that. Well, 
history says that we introduce it so that everyone knows it's there, and then we have public comment, and then we discuss. That's the traditional methodology. Mrs. Causey. I want to thank Mr. Birch for the explanation and also to ask him a follow-up question because when it was pulled back, um, when you wanted to have it pulled back and we vote, the board voted and agreed with you to have it pulled back, it was supposed to be discussed at the board retreat. This is an accurate statement. And I don't dictate retreat, timing, scheduling, or if the board's agenda will reflect whatever points. That was my suggestion to the board. So, Mr. Gillis, you haven't scheduled a board retreat? I did not schedule a board retreat. So will there be a board retreat? It's not my intention to. The majority of this board isn't going to be here, and making, um, making commitments for the new board seems inappropriate. And that would seem to be the consensus of, of those around this dais. So, well, was there a survey that you sent out or an email that you sent out? No, ma'am. Okay. So it's not your intention to have a board retreat? Correct. Okay. So, Mr. Birch, could we then put this policy up for at the next policy review committee meeting? Well, I'm happy to talk with staff because there are a number of things. Because of meetings that have gone to midnight, there have been um, skipped policies. So um, I'm happy to sit with staff and see what we have out there and just as we added uh, for um, uh, our next meeting a matter related to uh, nutrition um, we can see what time we have and we'll take a good effort to include important matters thank you okay so the motion is to uh, move policies 3111 3133 3121 and 5200 all in favor please raise your hands that's unanimous, thank you. Next on our agenda is consideration, this is item P, consider P1, consideration of the privately funded capital project playground recreational equipment. Um, I'm sorry, play recreational, let me try that again. <laughs> playground relocation and enhancement at Pot Spring Elementary School, Ms. Byers. So good evening again. This time I'm bringing forward uh, the approval for a privately funded capital improvement project for the relocation and installation of an enhanced school playground at Pot Spring Elementary School. Um, the total cost for this project, which is $76,093.20, um, is going to be funded by the uh, Pot Spring PTA, who raised $43,320 for this project. And then the BCPS Office of Facilities uh, Construction and Improvement will provide the remaining balance. Um, as reflected in the quote, this project will be completed by Play Power LT, Farmington Inc. And in accordance with policy 7330, um, this has progressed through all of our normal internal processes for review. And I would just like to take a moment to thank and recognize um, a member of the Pot Spring PTA board, Mr. Katz, who's here, as well as Principal Jane Martin. Very good. Do I have a motion to approve the playground relocation and enhancement at Pot Spring Elementary School? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your. Oops, there's discussion. Mrs. Causey. I just wanted to say thank you uh, to all the staff that have moved this forward. Pot Spring Elementary School community has worked hard raising the money, the PTA, and they're really looking forward to providing this for the children. It'll be ready before school starts everything go, going well, so I appreciate the work of the staff to bring it forward tonight. Thank you very much. Awesome. Any further comment? All right. All in favor, please raise your hand. That's unanimous. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Byers. N next on our agenda is the new item P2, uh, the resolution regarding school climate. Um, and how about if we begin with a motion to accept that resolution? so we can then have a discussion. So moved. All right, is there a second? Second. Now, discussion. Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good evening, Mr. Gillis, um, Mrs. White, fellow board members. I'd first like to thank Mrs. White for adding this item to tonight's agenda. I do appreciate that. I also appreciate Mrs. White's establishment of the Discipline Council, as discussed, and I look forward to learning more about the Council and potentially participating in its work. 
The resolution I present to you tonight is not mutually exclusive to the council as it focuses on board policies, which is the work of the board. Um, before you is a copy of this resolution, which reads, whereas the Board of Education of Baltimore County holds the needs of BCPS students as its first priority and is committed to providing a safe and secure learning environment that is positive, respectful, and caring. And whereas a hostile education environment substantially interferes with students and staff's educational and professional benefits, opportunities, and performance, as well as with their physical and psychological well being. And whereas bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, and intimidation are strictly prohibited by federal law and will not be tolerated in Baltimore County Public Schools. And whereas more than 40% of BCPS students, 40% of school based staff, and 30% of parents agree that bullying is a problem at their school, and whereas more than 500 instances of bullying were reported in the previous past two school years, with no significant decrease in the number of reported instances, and whereas 30% of secondary students do not feel safe at school, and whereas the arrest rates for inappropriate student conduct have increased in three or four school zones from 2016-2017 to 2017-18, and whereas the board as the governing body of the school system fulfills its mission by adopting policies concerning the effectiveness of the school system, as well as the standards needed for improvement of the school system. And whereas the board believes that its ability to govern is strengthened by its connections to the community it serves and is legally empowered to establish citizen advisory committees, Therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Baltimore County hereby establishes an internal subcommittee on school climate, student behavior, and discipline for the purpose of reviewing and recommending changes to board policies in order to improve school climate through at least quarterly meetings and be it further resolved that the board hereby establishes the School Climate, Student Behavior, and Discipline Citizens Advisory Committee for the purpose of providing information and recommendations to the board through at least quarterly meetings with the board. All right, further discussion. Mrs. Causey. I think we've heard not just this evening and not just the emails that we received, but also over the course of this year and, and last year and the year before, uh, the increasing concerns. And I just think this is a, a, an appropriate way to handle it. I believe that it is, uh, I agree with Mrs. Hen, it is not mutually exclusive and that the council that the superintendent is recommending is something that can also be considered. Um, because as so many of our stakeholders said, there's work to be done and we can all take part in it. The board has its role with policies, and as I mentioned earlier, the discipline policy was pulled back last year, and it has not been considered in over a year. And that is of vital importance to review, to get input from our citizens, from our stakeholders, uh, to be able to move forward in the best way for all of our students and our teachers and the whole school communities. Mr. Stewart. So I think that's the key, is moving forward together for the benefit of our entire system. And I believe that the council and its work that's already begun is an important instrument in that endeavor. And to the extent that this board wants to have better engagement with that council, can have members on that council uh, and indeed work in the same direction. Oftentimes in government and in elsewhere, we like to do things that feel good, including creating committees and subcommittees and so forth, but sometimes just buckling down and getting to work with the things that are already happening without the pride of ownership or authorship is sometimes important. And I think that there might be members of this board who'd be willing to contribute to that work on a more day-to-day -day basis. Mrs. Eaton. I agree that everyone wants to combat discipline. I also agree with your first nine paragraphs. However, I agree with Nick that we already have these task force in place and I think we need to work together within what we have established already. Ed, Ms. Attic, go ahead. Okay, I agree with, <laughs> I'm Mr. sorry, Stewart. I'm wrong. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart. Mrs. and Ms. Eaton, that if you already have a plan in place, you should hang on to that and make that better. And at the end of the day, if you make that better, it keeps going. It's a domino effect for change to happen. Ed, Mr. Virch, and then we'll get over on this side. Thank you, Ed. I'd ask um, um, my fellow Perry Hall resident, Julie Hen, 
whether she would be willing to accept an amendment that rather than creating a subcommittee, it deletes that first resolve clause and would proceed with the resolved for a school climate, student behavior, and disciplined citizens advisory committee. So as opposed to two res resolved clauses, there would only be one and it would be the second one. Would you be willing to accept that amendment? I would. I will make that motion and I have written it out someplace and uh, I will forward that to uh, the appropriate party. Is there a second? Second. All right, so now the motion that's being discussed is the same resolution as before, uh, but the, uh, the resolution is, uh, or is, it, is there discussion on the motion to amend? Mrs. Hen. I support Mr. Virch's motion um, with the understanding that there will be board involvement in um, the discipline council, which we've been told there would be. So sure. in good faith, I would support removing that right. whereas. Mrs. Miller and then Mr. Stort. Uh, I, I would just like to take a trip down memory lane for a minute and remind the board about what happened with the safety and technology committee. Um, and it, it began this sort of way where a board member, it was me on that one, had proposed a board level committee. And because that was not favored by um, our superintendent at the time, um, he came up with, oh, I've already got it taken care of. I've already started something similar that's internal. And we're now at this point where safety and technology, we only meet quarterly. Our last meeting was canceled, so it will be six months between meetings. It basically has been, um, you know, made ineffective. And so, um, I'm going to support the motion and the amendment, but I do want to just remind this board of what can happen when we allow this kind of thing. Instead of it being a board initiative, we allow it to be taken out of the hands of the board and put in the central office under the control of the superintendent. Not always the best outcome, so I just want to make sure that if we're going to go that direction, that the board makes sure we're on top of it and that it's actually effective. Mr. Stewart. So I would be eager, I suppose, to understand better the from the administration what sort of inputs we are getting on the council now and whether the citizen advisory committee would serve a critical role in as much as it provides for additional information as it relates to that entity. One more time. There you okay, go. there we go. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. I would see it as a, a duplication of efforts, quite frankly. Um, I do believe that we have several members. In terms of the, the council, again, the whole purpose is to make sure that we have parent, teacher, and student voice as part of the council and with um, the appointment of board membership as well. Um, again, we're talking about having all perspectives um, noticed, recognized, and valued when it comes to student behavior and discipline. So I would hate for us to duplicate efforts um, unnecessarily. Also, I would say in consideration of a resolution, I question some of the data that is here in the resolution. I'm not quite sure the sources of the data. Uh, and so I would want the board to have accurate data points if you're considering a resolution that you would, and staff would have to be able to assist uh, with that prior to the adoption of a resolution, I believe. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the data points in the resolution were provided by BCPS, um, both in the 2017 BCPS stakeholder survey, as well as presentations that the board has received. They were taken directly from um, system materials. Secondly, the Citizens Advisory Committee that this resolution establishes would be a permanent group focused on school climate. Um, this action signifies that the board takes this seriously in that we provide we need to provide parents students and teachers with permanent voices 
on this subject as we do with other um, regional and special area advisory groups so that we can continue to receive input. This isn't a one-time process. We need to receive input on a regular basis. Should any changes be made, and hopefully they are made to our policies, we need to be able to gauge how effective those changes are. And the ones who best are informed to inform advise us of those are our parents, um, teachers, students, staff. So this, I do not agree with Mrs. White's comment that this is a duplication of efforts, but rather um, is an action that signifies our understanding of the importance of this, of the importance of keeping our students safe, and by establishing a permanent committee focused on that to advise us on a regular basis. Uh, and I would ask, Dr. Brown, uh, the arrest rate um, for zones in Greece uh, it says has increased in three of the four school zones. Is that a part of the stakeholder survey? No, it's not part of the stakeholder survey. Thank you. Um, so the question that I, I think has caused me concern as well is the third to the last whereas that says the arrest rates for inappropriate student conduct have increased in three of four school zones. Dr. Brown? So uh, while a report was put together that um, I could see where that inference was made, one of the things that wasn't taken into consideration in that year-to-year -year comparison was the fact that some of the schools actually changed zones from year to year, and that could have some bearing on, on the calculation. I do think it's worth revisiting the data to, to ensure that, that the resolution accurately reflects um, the intent. Mr. Ulfelder. Thank, thank you. What concerns me is that when we pass a resolution, there's no plan. Uh, we don't know how big of a committee, uh, how it will be staffed. Uh, I would rather see a plan brought forward that identifies uh, the committee, its mission, its purpose, the method of reporting, how selection to this committee uh, will be accomplished. Uh, it just concerns me we pass a resolution and there's nothing to substantiate behind it. So I, I'd be more concerned. That I would first rather see a, a, a systematic plan, a comprehensive plan, and also to make sure, as was pointed out, that this is not in conflict and is really in coordination uh, with what the superintendent has on board. Mr. Young. We currently have advisory councils in each of the educational areas that meet with the um, local constituents. So this work that's specified in the last resolve can be done by them already. They are already in place. Um, they're already in place and staffed and ready to go. Mrs. Miller and then Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Um, I'm hearing a lot of the same. Um, objections that we heard with the safety and technology committee du duplication of efforts and I again I, I disagree that this is a duplication hopefully we all have the same aim um, I it was turned in to uh, from a duplication of effort to an elimination of effort with the sit committee and I'm afraid of the same thing happening um, I had proposed amendments to our discipline policies, I believe it was in April of 2017, and here we, I, at least then, it might have even been the prior year, but I, it's been over a year and we're still waiting. So um, there's obviously not a big urgent push in our central office. Ms. Miller, I would just remind the but board that the board has because uh, held the, the discipline policies. I have heard that comment, comment made I've quite gone. a few Mrs. times. Mrs. Miller, hold on. No. You, I have heard you paused and no. she. Uh, no, no, okay, I'm be, in the we'll middle. We'll be back to her that, in one second, correct. Ms. Hayden. I we'll she can, she can have her turn. Unfair. Okay, we'll be she can have her turn. And, and the other objection that I'm hearing is there aren't any details. Well, this is just a resolution. The details will be developed after we decide that this is what we want to do. Another reason having details and too many details is that they get picked apart and then that they become the reason for not passing something such as we've had changes in zones. Okay, but the report still stated what's stated here. So it's not inaccurate. 
Um, and, and then the issue over that we've already got citizen advisory committees. This is a huge issue, safety and discipline and behavior. It would bog down our advisory councils without having a dedicated council of its own to address these issues, which are countywide. So instead of having each advisory council talk about the same things individually, let's have a citizen advisory group countywide that can come together and advise the board. You know, let's superintendent respond and then Mr. Thank you, Stewart. Mr. Chair. I just wanted to respond to the, the um, notion about the discipline policy because I have heard the, the same comments uh, repeated now um, at quite a few board meetings about how the discipline policy has not come back to the board. Um, I just wanted to remind the board that it was the board's action, um, and I believe it was the la uh, through PRC, uh, that the board has not um, decided then to bring it back to the board's consideration. So this is not, um, I feel that I see, feel a little protective of staff here because this is not the staff holding up the discipline policy. This is the board holding up the discipline policy. Mr. Stewart. Well, first I want to point out that the individuals who continue to clamor for decorum and proper procedure are the ones who just shouted down our interim superintendent. But number two is I do believe, Ms. Miller, that you are devaluing the work of our advisory councils and that you would suggest that they're unable to handle an issue of sys systemic importance. They deal with it all the time, including curricula, including transportation. They deal with all those issues. And yes, they're all talking about them at the same time. It's still valuable to get their input. But lastly, if we want to talk about signifying the importance of this, we've done that tonight by elevating the conversation by discussing the councils and raising the profile of this council um, that we are talking about staffing with board members and driving this forward together. This to me makes a lot of sense if we can all get together and behind it and support it. That's, that is what drives things forward, not just creating them, but actually acting behind them in, in a resolve. Mrs. Hen. Thank you. Um, I want to share a letter the full board received earlier today from Delegate Christian Mealy in full support of this resolution. He writes, um, as the board sets policy for the school system, this is an appropriate first step to ensure that this issue is given the attention it requires by those who can bring about the necessary changes at the policy level. It is important that this newly established board committee receive regular input and feedback for ongoing policy adjustments to address this complex and evolving issue. The Citizens Advisory Group established through this resolution would serve as an effective means of ensuring that parent, student, and teacher voices are represented in this process in a permanent and meaningful way. I respectfully request that you include this resolution on tonight's agenda and vote to adopt it without hesitation. Um, Delegate Mealy speaks to this resolution as complementary of the Anti-Bullying Task Force, um, which was recently legislated. The, what differentiates this um, really is a focus on the permanence of this committee and the, the importance of this issue. And it does require um, a dedicated focus um, because it is complex and the solutions aren't going to be arrived at overnight. We need a permanent group to do so. Um, if there is objection to the seventh um, clause, I would be willing to strike that um, if there is dispute of that statistic. Okay, let's first vote on the motion to amend by deleting the first resolved clause. Mr. Hayden, you want to speak to that? I want to speak to what we were just talking about. I had my hand up. I'm sorry. I should have shouted. That would have taken care of Mr. Stewart's sensibilities. My concern is that we get something done and my year and a fraction back on the board has not led me to a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling that we get things done. And I think this is too important to let it go anywhere other than to the board members and the board members stay up to their ears in it because discipline and handling the problems in our school is number one. If we don't get that done, we won't provide good education. We don't want to be able to say we have a program. Well, there's an old friend of mine who lives out in the West now uh, says when I talk to him about things, he says, is this another big hat, no cattle? 
I've seen that too many times. Big hat, no cattle. And we talk to talk, but things don't get done. We have got to get something done on this discipline issue. And the board has the power to make things happen if the board will use that power. If the board sloughs it off and says, well, let's let the superintendent and staff do it, and we'll have a committee or another committee, we'll get to the point where, guess what? Nothing gets done, and we can't afford that. There are too many instances of young people being injured in our communities because of this violence that goes on in the schools, and we're not able to handle that. The board is responsible. Each and every person who sits around this table is responsible for what's happening out in that community. And to say that, well, we'll just give it to the superintendent, that's wrong. Things that are important, they belong to the board, they should be followed by the board, and the board should keep detailed involvement in their implementation. And if we don't, we are making a tremendous, tremendous mistake that will affect the boys and girls of Baltimore County. Mr. Stewart, do you have a comment on the motion to amend? I have comment on what was just discussed, which is that we ought to consider whether the reason we feel at times that we don't get things done is because we are being pulled in many different directions by the members of this board, as opposed to finding unity in a core issue I think we can all agree about, which is to improve safety and to take charge and take a role in promoting this discussion at a council or committee level. And we have that ongoing. And instead of discussing about who's going to win or lose this particular fight and citing delegates and bringing in politics, maybe we just get something done on it. Ms. Adekoya. Um, I, want us, I want us to say, if all of our efforts is to help the children, why not just work together? It does not take much for your idea and her idea to come together and simply be for the kids. It doesn't take much for your, your idea. And wait, hold up. I want to tell, um, say something about the fact that people keep saying you don't get nothing done. If you don't get nothing done, it's obviously because maybe we're the problem. Maybe we're the ones who need to evaluate. What are we doing? How are we going about things? How are we thinking? What do, where do we go back to say we are the ones who are probably causing us not getting anything done? And also, um, I wanted to mention that it doesn't cost anything. I think I'll just repeat what I said. It doesn't cost anything for everybody to work together. It's for the children, regardless of anything. It doesn't matter who made it. It doesn't matter who said, okay, I slept the night and I woke up and I had this idea. If we're willing to work together and say we want better for our children, efforts will be made because we're working together. Amen. Mr. Young. We currently have five permanent educational advisory councils with the coordinator. We could walk out of this meeting tonight with the directive towards that coordinator and towards those councils to start holding meetings specifically targeted to discussion of school climate. And those committees are, are located in their communities, so they are uniquely aware of all of the issues that go into their community and can come up with more of the information we need to try to help target the issues in those particular communities and in the system as a whole. Mr. Hayden. I'm glad to see Mr. Young agrees with my uh, position on this, that we can walk out of here tonight. We can walk, we the board can walk out of here tonight with a determination that we are going to direct these things to happen. We are going to follow up to make sure that they happen. This is not something that we can put aside and say, well, it'll get better. Well, it hasn't gotten better. It's gotten worse. More kids have been accosted in the neighborhoods. More kids have had problems out there. And we can't let that happen. Uh, we sure don't want to be in a position where the next headline is something unimaginable 
happens to one of the children in, in one of our schools. We, the board, have to take control of this. We, the board, have to make sure that things happen. All right, so the motion, uh, the, the, there's, a, oh no, there's a resolution, and there's a motion to amend the resolution to strike the first resolved clause. I think it's time for a vote on that. All in favor of striking the resolved clause? Excuse me, exactly which resolved clause first, are you speaking about? The first resolved clause. Okay. All in favor of striking? I have another comment on it. All right, do we have a comment on the motion to strike the resolved clause? Uh, yeah. Mrs. Causey. Let's strike that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've been listening to my fellow board members and I appreciate all of the conversation and I appreciate the intensity and I appreciate our new student member of the board chiming in right away with what's so vitally important to the students, which is safety and order in the classrooms. I would say that there is a difference in the board passing a resolution of what the board wants to see happen than with the superintendent creating a council. I would point out that in the weekly update that we received on July 6, it points out that there were two work groups that were established in 27-2018 to examine these issues. How many written reports has the board received from those two work groups throughout the year? How many written reports has this board received from the Safety and Technology Committee in the last two years or three years? Who sets the meeting schedule? Who sets the agenda? It is the board's responsibility to set the policies and programs of education so that we can achieve our mission of educating our children, and we have to do that in ordered and safe environments. It is up to the board. That is our legal responsibility. Of course we're going to work with the interim superintendent. Of course we're going to work with the staff. The difference is, is who is going to take responsibility. And it is legally the board's responsibility to work on the policies and to approve them and to get the input that we need. Now I heard the superintendent say that it's the board that's holding up the discipline policy. So I would ask my chair of the policy review committee, Mr. Virch, why has the policy not come back to let's us? Keep, let's keep the discussion on the resolution and the a motion to amend by deleting the sec first resolved clause. So my point is, and if you don't want to have answers to any of my questions, that's fine. The, the point is the board needs to be in charge because it's our legal responsibility. Does anyone have anything else to say on the, sec on the deleting the first resolved clause? Mrs. Han. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would ask my colleague, Mr. Virch, to consider withdrawing his motion so that we can vote on the resolution as is. Um, we need to hold ourselves accountable to address this. It's not about not working together was a double negative, I apologize. It's about working together, but it's about identifying an owner of this, this issue. The focus is on the policies. As the board, we make the policies and direct the superintendent to create rules that implement those policies. This is not mutually exclusive of the council. The council is focused on how to implement the policies that we create. So. I any would further, ask Mr. Virch any to further discussion withdraw on his the, motion. Uh, Ed, um, oh. if I may, um, I've been asked if um, the resolution's authoress uh, would agree to withdraw her second, then I certainly will withdraw my motion. Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll withdraw, withdraw my it. second. All right, so now we have the resolution as a whole. Mr. Yulefelder. Thank you. Um, I can't support the resolution for a very simple reason. Um, whereas four, five, six, and seven uh, talk about data, and it reminds me of asking, of asking someone to sign this document without uh, any uh, fact check whether these uh, statements here are correct. If you remove four, five, six, and seven, I'd be happy to support the resolution. All right, um, Mrs. Causey. I would just like to make a point that every member of this board has had this resolution for over four weeks. So if we were concerned with fact checking, that could have been brought up before th so, this moment. So my concern is that we are really all in this together. And if we already have 
the teachers and the parents and the students and the administrators, and we're going to add board members to a council that is going to be addressing these important issues, why would we want to create a separate council or a separate committee that is only going to need staff, which is going to be the same people that are already on the council, which is just going to duplicate effort of, because the because a committee of the board is going to need staff to be able to address issues, and those issues will be addressed in the council. So I I, I kind of uh, liked removing the first resolved clause so that there could be a citizens advisory committee, which is not a bad idea. Um, and I like eliminating uh, the third to the last whereas clause about um, about arrest rates, um, but I'm, I, I really think that by duplicating effort, we're really diluting our opportunity to address matters. Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, um, I'll reiterate that I don't see this as a duplication of effort, but rather assigning an owner, and that, is owner, that owner is the board. We can walk away here tonight saying, we're going to own this. We're going to work in cooperation with staff and stakeholders, but ultimately the buck stops with us. And at the end of the day, we're going to make sure this gets done. That's what this resolution accomplishes. These data points are all public information. I'd be willing to strike them for your support because we need to get this done. However, I do believe it's important to assign an owner. You assign an ownership to a group, what happens? Nothing gets done. We assign it to ourselves. Guess what? We hold ourselves accountable to make sure we take care of it. Okay. We're ready for a vote on the resolution. All in favor of the resolution uh, in its whole, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four. The resolution fails for a lack of majority. All right. Next on the agenda is. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. There were members that said that if certain paragraphs were struck that they would support it, so I would ask them to state specifically which paragraphs. And well, Ms. Hen had said that she would consider other. So if there's a motion to be made, I'll, I'll entertain a motion, but I'm not just going to go around and ask people what they want stricken. Uh, does somebody have a motion to be made? Back Mrs. And Hen. Clean it up. I move to amend the re resolution to strike the seventh whereas clause regarding arrest rates. Second. All right. So, is, so you, you, you would have to introduce this resolution again without that arrest rate uh, whereas because your resolution failed. Okay. Is that what you intend to do? Yes. All right. Um, and there's been a second. Any discussion on that? All in favor of the resolution which would now delete the whereas clause that begins the arrest rates for inappropriate raise your hand fails for a lack of majority four votes okay next on mrs hen i move to reintroduce the resolution striking the seventh whereas and the fourth through sixth so four through seven those that my colleague, Mr. Yulfelder, had indicated. You introduced the resolution without those without four, four whereas paragraphs. So the second. motion. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second for the resolution that has uh, stricken whereas numbers four, five, six, and seven. Any discussion? I have a question. Mr. Well, what Yulfelder. What, I, I might have missed it. What did we do about the uh, first resolve? It's back in because Mr. Virch and Mrs. Hen withdrew their motion to amend. Um, and that was voted, uh, the whole resolution was voted down. Now we're on this. Any discussion on all in favor of the resolution without whereas is four, five, six, and seven, raise your hand. The motion fails for lack of majority has four votes. Now, next on our agenda. Mr. Chair, I'd like to reintroduce the resolution striking clauses four through seven as well as ten the first resolved the first resolved all right is there a second to that second all right now the motion is a resolution that has whereas clauses one two three eight and nine and only the second resolved per, uh, provision is there discussion mr hayden I can't agree with that, and, and I am, it's beyond reason that this board 
will not open its eyes to what we're facing out in the community and seeing what is going on and thinking that the system is out there making things happen. The system is not making anything happen out there to any magnitude that we can talk about. Look at the crime reports. Look at the police reports about what's going on. Look how many times our kids are involved. A look at a program that's been put out there with more detail in how you protect the school than how you protect the White House. You don't need that. You need basics. We are ignoring the basics. We are ignoring what we have to do. This board is ignoring what has to be done to keep the boys and girls of Baltimore County safe in our schools. And if they're not safe, guess what? They're not going to learn. Mrs. Miller. This first resolve um, establishes a, a subcommittee for a singular purpose, and that is for us to be um, recommending changes to our discipline policies. That's not a lot to ask. I believe that, uh, or I would assume that the um, committee that the superintendent is establishing would have a broader purpose. So for us to just say, we want to review and recommend changes to our discipline policies is not going to be any kind of conflict or uh, big duplication. Uh, we can take that piece. That's our charge anyway, uh, is to revise our policies. Um, I'm seeing a concerted effort by the majority on this board to pick apart this resolution that has only two, th we're only asking two things. Let's revise our discipline policies and let's involve public, the public input into this very serious issue. And it's being picked apart. And it's obvious because the uh, objections, we eliminated them. And you still aren't voting for this. Mr. Young and then Mr. Stewart. Are we in the middle of a motion? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to hold my comments until after the vote. All righty. Mr. Stewart. So I'll just note that the last resolved clause makes a reference to the subcommittee that's formed by the now uh, deleted resolved clause. And so we would need to agree as a board to whom those recommendations are going to be made, either to the council or to the board or to both. Well, point well taken. Well taken. Point okay. well taken. Um, so, um, any comment on that? I would ten. Oh. Only that I would be willing to strike the word subcommittee from the second resolved. Okay. Is there a second to whatever your who seconded your motion before? Catherine. Well, I'll second I, this one. Okay. All right. Um, further discussion. So the motion is a resolution which has whereas paragraphs 1, 2, 3, 8, and 9, and resolved paragraph 2. All in favor, please raise your hand. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. The motion carries. Yeah. All right. Now, next on our agenda. Mr. Chair. Mrs. Causey. Related to this resolution and to this very important issue, the superintendent had, interim superintendent had stated that it is the board that is holding up reviewing the discipline policy. So I would like to ask the chair of the policy review committee if in fact that is the case, if, if there is some confusion as to whose responsibility it is to bring the policy out, I would like that clarified with all of us here. Is that well, is I would like Mr. Ed, Birch Ed, to answer. Right. Because well, it's very straightforward, because uh, respectfully. It is very straightforward, and this has been answered previously at a policy review committee meeting. There was no re-referral to the policy review committee, so there is nothing to bring out of the policy review committee. Now, the board can decide where a policy draft that had previously come to the board, where it will go, but, and I note that we're now straying from this particular agenda item, but to answer the member's question a third time now, 
it is not in the policy review committee. Period. Okay, Mr. Young, did you? You're done? Okay. Mrs. Causey. I would like to make a motion that the discipline policy come back to the policy review committee in October and that the work of the superintendent's council and the work of the newly established school climate student behavior and discipline citizens advisory committee have their input brought forward in that policy review committee meeting. Second. All right, so I think the, mo the motion is for the PRC to do something in October. All right, is Ms. Dugelfelder. Um, I may ask this of uh, Mr. Birch, I don't think you know the answer. Uh, how many policies do we have relative to discipline? I, I'm sure it's more than one. There are interlocking and when one looks at policy uh, discipline draft, one will see a host of related policies. So it, climate in our schools is intricately related. Uh, as a person who used to sit in this very seat used to say, uh, order precedes learning. And that was a former teacher with 30 years of experience. So it really is integral to the success and the excellence in our organization. Uh, we can go back and we can count all of those. Um, to the extent that, the, you know, the Policy Review Committee is a committee of the board and will do what the board wants. Um, but to presume that in any given board uh, policy review committee meeting that um, a few hammers and a few nails are going to fix something, that even the Maryland General Assembly attached a two and a half year time frame to study the issue, a subset issue of bullying in our schools. That was their time frame. And I would point out that one of the legislators whose name was mentioned tonight was in fact a person who voted in favor of that time frame. So whatever may be the sense of urgency, uh, I don't know anyone who, who, who thinks that we should have unsafe schools, but let's not kid ourselves. Mr. Stewart really did do an excellent job describing uh, the concept of doing something that feels good when instead we already have a vehicle that we can get on board with and we can begin to make progress collaboratively. I note there are four members, five members of the Policy Review Committee, assuming that our student member kind of uh, gets back uh, pointed to it. Um, that's a way smaller group to work with than that entity which is supposed to be providing information to the Policy Review Committee. So I think that the caboose should not be running the engine I think the engine should be running the train. And when we get the results of that council with its extensive membership, note, I heard the superintendent share with us the invitation, the extending of the hand to the anti-bullying task force that, that, would that would allow participation by school counselors, as I've said previously, folks who are on the front line. A principal from a senior high, I strike that from a high school, from a middle school and from elementary school. This participation, including SROs, it's a very extensive group of folks with expertise to provide inputs as opposed to simply placing all of your, uh, r uh, all of your hopes on a policy review committee in October to modify uh, or, or create a new vision of, of discipline and safety in our schools. That's why someone has already gotten out in front, and that was our interim superintendent with this council. And now we're gonna have the benefit of a citizen's advisory council uh, members who are now, uh, I suspect, going to be focusing even greater on this topic from, from the discussions that we're having. I, I know that I won't be silent uh, listening to uh, members from our advisory councils when it comes to this. Uh, we had a hearing last year. It's time for us to have another hearing. We had, our, we had a listening tour of our superintendent out in uh, our schools. We had a, a school climate a tour where uh, folks came and spoke. I remember going to Oliver Beach and listening to folks talk specifically about school climate and the things there. In Point fact, the police, the police were, were participating in that. So that's, I mean, I'm, I'm sharing what I think. I answered the question and I think I added some other things to it. There so there's a motion on the table to direct the PRC to review discipline policies in October. Uh, Mrs. Miller. 
Thank you. To answer Mr. Yulefelder's question, there are two primary discipline policies, 5550 and 5560, but there are some other extraneous policies that we should probably look at as well. Um, as far as some of the comments that Mr. Virch made, um, what the uh, General Assembly did was looking at a whole statewide issue. What the board needs to do is simply to look at our policies. This is what we control. Um, and both of these resolves were to that end, was to um, develop a mechanism and input to begin the process of getting these policies brought forward because they've been sat on for over a year. And I disagree with Mr. Virch's assessment that it is not something that the Policy Review Committee can do. I think that they can uh, ask for certain policies to be brought forward. As a matter of fact, I believe that they've done that in, in the past. So uh, I do support the motion. Okay, so the motion is to direct the PRC to review discipline policies in October. Further discussion? Mrs. Causey? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just point out that the work on the Policy Review Committee is not, does not have to be done in one meeting. But in any goal that we want to actually try and achieve something, it needs to be a SMART goal, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-defined. So we're talking about putting a SMART goal in place of discussing discipline policies at the October meeting with input from the superintendent's work councils, which are streamlining those two previous work groups, if I'm to understand that, and the additional input from the committee that we've just put into place. So I think it's a very appropriate and it's a very smart goal and it's one that our stakeholders will really appreciate and everyone can get behind to start the process. Okay. And, and I would just note that Mr. the Mr. chapter Birch. 496 um, laws of Maryland, which is in fact the anti-bullying task force, is entitled not Maryland anti-bullying task force, but is simply entitled Baltimore only, County. That's right. It only addresses task Baltimore force. County. And that's the last comment. Yeah. All right. So all in favor of a motion to direct the PRC to uh, review discipline policies in October, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The motion carries. Okay. Um, and thank you very much. I appreciate that. Next support. on our agenda is the new item P3, which concerns the Employee Benefit Reserve Fund. And I had uh, given to all of the board members through board docs. Uh, the Office of Budget and Finance Director Keith Dorsey's June 20, 2018 letter, which addresses the issue that was raised by one or more board members at a prior meeting, June 12, I believe, um, regarding funding retiree health care, that OPEB. And Mr. Dorsey's letter concludes by saying, the action to eliminate the $25 million OPEB funding did not impact retiree health care. Those costs are paid through a separate OPEB trust that covers health care expenses for retirees of the general county government, the school system, the community college, and the library. I think he's addressed the concern that, uh, that board members uh, voiced. Uh, but with that letter, um, I'll open it up for any discussion or comment anyone has. Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and I'm glad that we received this letter because it did clarify some things, although I don't think that um, Mr. Dorsey understood the um, concerns that, that were being expressed. It was, it was much broader than, than the two points that he brought up. Um, the board really needs to understand um, the, what the long-term consequences are for, for employees due to this lack of funding reserves for this year because, I, you know, he said it's not impacting us this year, but what, what's going to happen in, in the future? How often has this occurred in the past? And is it expected to occur in the future since 
The STEP program is an ongoing program. We have already dwindled down our general fund. Um, so they're going to have to come up with ways to fund STAT. So it's very concerning that this is one of the ways that they have chosen. Um, I'd also like to understand, and I'm just going to throw out questions here because I, I don't think that we've done anything to try to gather up, um, answer any of the questions that we had. Um, I'd like to understand what is an advisable reserve fund balance because if you look at the um, average um, annual usage or drainage of that fund compared to what is in it, it looks like we've only got about five years worth of reserves. Um, I want to understand what this move indicates with regard to the sustainability of the STAT program and other BCPS expenditures, because he did address that this isn't solely for the STAT program. We understood that from the beginning. But I want to know how much was for the STAT program. What, 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 you know, what's the breakdown for other programs as well? Um, there were a number of questions um, sent to the board from Joanne Simpson. Um, so I'll, I'll go through a couple of those just to get them out there. Um, she's asking, won't this, again, won't this continue under the expanded full implementation of the program? And if not, where will future county-related rela funding originate? Um, how exactly are these reserves being used? It, it describes how the retirees' medical coverage is guaranteed by law and contracts, um, but if we, we are creating potentially gaps that is going to increase liability elsewhere. Um, she listed several questions, um, and, I, and I'm going to just ask that the uh, central office look into these issues and provide some answers, whether they have to go back to the county, um, go back to the uh, county auditor's office and get answers to some of these questions. I'm going to go ahead and forward um, my list along with Joanne Simpson's list and, um, and ask that we be able to get answers at our next meeting, because I don't think the way this was handled, I mean, I've been asking for this to be an agenda item for a couple of meetings now, and it was last minute that we um, finally were able to get it on. So um, would that be a possibility that if we, if the board sends questions, would we be able to get answers for the next meeting? So first, I, I would not want to answer for the county because I, th I believe that the county would have to uh, make some determinations about that. There is no um, desire to resist. I just cannot answer for them. Um, the, as you know, Baltimore County government is a separate entity, so I, I'm we not can't asking you summon to them, them, and we can't um, demand anything. They have sent us uh, the information related um, to the the questions prior to. So um, I would be reluctant to say what the county can and cannot answer. Um, and I would also ask. Um, if this is the will and desire of the full board. So let's, uh, Mr. Yulefutter has a comment. Um, more than a comment, uh, let, let me see if I can shed some light on exactly what this uh, fund, the trust fund is. Uh, first of all, this is a trust fund that annually uh, actuaries look at to determine based on the number of retirees and a lot of other factors, they determine how much money the fund should have in order to properly cover uh, the, what the actuaries say is the amount of money that's needed. Uh, very similar to uh, a defined benefit plan that the federal government approves. And, and what it basically says is this. Uh, the actuary will tell you that you need X amount of dollars and therefore uh, your contribution for this year in order to uh, make the plan uh, what it should be based on their calculations is so, so forth. However, 
the the actuarial amount that is needed is is determined based on what the fund itself has earned for the year. And I will tell you from other organizations, most actuaries will take anywhere from maybe a four and a half to a six or seven percent return. Uh, according to this letter, the rate of return for fiscal 17 was 13.5 percent. So therefore, uh, you're allowed to reduce or eliminate your contribution for the current year because you are meeting the what the um, actuary say is needed to legally fund what the <laughs> anticipated future needs are. Now, let's suppose, as has happened in the past, you come into a year where you only earn about three and a half or four percent. And when you, when you run the numbers, you find, well, then the contribution for that year, the fund should be worth this, it's only worth that. So you have to provide in your budget for what is needed to make it actuarially sound. Um, and if you read in there, the fund is managed strategically with a 30-year outlook. So they're not looking at next year or the year after, they're looking over a 30-year period. Um, and therefore, it, it, the need to fund it this year may not be there. In fact, based on a 13.5% return, I assure you that there's no need to fund it for the current year. That isn't to say what will be next year. But as the economy is going right now, my suspect will be that uh, perhaps in the next year, you're not going to have to fund it either because of the return on the fund, uh, which I believe is... <coughs> 400 and some million dollars. 422. Uh, 422 is sufficient to cover what the actual anticipated needs are for the future. So that, that is the reason why there was no funding okay. for this current so, year. So Mrs. Miller uh, has a request that questions be sent to, um, uh, to me, I guess, and that we get answers. And I think that the, the, this would ha I agree that this would have to be a request of the board as a whole. Um, because I think Mr. Dorsey explained everything already. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Ufelder, for that um, explanation. One of the issues that I have, uh, the question that's not answered, is how much of this realignment of the uh, general fund portion is going to STAT, because in my review of what has happened to the budget, over the last four years is that the amount that we're spending on technology is not sustainable and that, in fact, the realignments that we have made in the past have detrimented our students and our program of education. Um, I just need to point to the facilities issues to make that clear to everyone. I just went to the Catonsville High School capacity study uh, where there was community input being solicited. There's going to be another one at Carver. There's going to be another one in, um, on the east side, um, and the funds not needed for the OPEB this year were needed last year for facilities. So the question is not answered, and there are some additional questions. So I think this board should be interested in what percentage of the funding is going to each <laughs> specific area. And as Mr. Ufelder pointed out, if there is a downturn, or a, um, one of these investments does not go as well next year as this year, then how is that going to impact the entire budget? I am right now with um, one of two high schools in Baltimore County that does not have a plan in place, a date on the calendar for when they are going to achieve air and it's a, it's a school with almost 2,000 students in my district. I have other schools that have overcrowding that does not have a plan, no date on the calendar to fix that. So when we say, no, these funds were moved over to here because we didn't need them there yet, we have unmet needs. So every single dollar needs to be understood and accounted for. So I think this board should support sending questions to Mr. Gillis and him forwarding them to the interim superintendent our staff answering the ones that they can and any additional ones being sent along to the county to be answered in a time frame that's appropriate for them. Further discussion, Mrs. Miller. Regardless of whether this board supports it or not, because uh, we're traditionally or, or historically a, a non-curious board, uh, I will be submitting questions and I will be submitting uh, Joanne Simpson's questions as well 
and I will post them uh, publicly, and we should be getting answers. And as individual board members, we can ask questions of the system. Everything does not have to be collective. You know, we make individual decisions. We can ask individual questions, and I will be doing that. So, but we, as a board, we should also be uh, supporting the asking of questions, um, especially since this is a, a, of a lot of concern to a lot of teachers and, and staff members. Um, and I don't believe that uh, Ms. White has to have the whole board asking the questions. She can offer um, answers or offer to seek answers even from an individual board member. Okay, so um, I think that I, I'll need a, an expression of uh, majority of the board to uh, ask the, both the, the staff and ask, and ask um, Mr. Dorsey to address uh, questions that will be time consuming. So all in favor. A fav motion, can I, can I make a motion yeah, then? Sure. I move that the board submits questions regarding the uh, what do we call this? The employee benefit reserve funding to Ms. White to seek answers from Baltimore County. Is there a second to that? Second. Now, the motion is to uh, support the board submitting questions for uh, regarding employee benefit reserve funding for the board and the county to answer. Um, all in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Opposed? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Motion fails. All right. Next on our agenda uh, is board committee updates. The first one is the audit committee. The audit committee uh, met and uh, approved the uh, audit charter. Uh, the internal audit, like most other uh, internal audit uh, groups throughout all organizations has a charter that they uh, appropriately pass each year that sets out the mission and how they go about doing what they're doing. And I believe that the charter will be uh, presented at the next board meeting. Building and Contracts Committee. Mrs. Causey. Excuse me, I had a question sure. for Mr. Ufather. Uh So with the Audit Committee, I just wanted to ask if um, Contract LKO-423-18 Auditing Services, if that has been executed and initiated? Uh, it's not only been executed and initiated, but the audit is presently underway for the past two weeks. Okay, great, thank you very much. Building and contracts, no update. Uh, curriculum. Our last, uh, thank you, our last meeting was June 14th and we discussed a couple of the contracts that came before us tonight and interestingly enough we talked about uh, our music um, uh, program and the resources and found that we hadn't really purchased music books since the 80s and it was kind of interesting to uh, finally update the uh, resources for our music uh, instruction. Uh, we won't meet in July, I think we meet uh, August next. Policy review. The 80s, is that Tony Orlando and Dawn? <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Policy Review Committee, as has been previously stated tonight, uh, will have its next meeting in September. Digital safety. Uh, the quarterly safety and tech meeting was canceled and has not been rescheduled, so that's otherwise known as elimination of efforts. All right, there are uh, a series of informational items on uh, the materials, uh, but and our next meeting is August 7. We're adjourned.